said that they could just tell from the tone of debate late this afternoon that something seemed to be happening. Uh, and at one point, Joe Clark may have let something slip when he suggested that, uh, that we would see what would be happening within hours, whether he knew at that point whether uh, uh, the Americans were about to attack or not. Uh, we may not know for quite a while. All right, Wendy. Well, we'll uh, wait to hear the Prime Minister's uh, remarks. And if he actually is in the uh, that back room, they can't be that uh, far away before he heads into the uh, House of Commons. Uh, information now uh, going down to a trickle in terms of what's coming, uh, what's happening in Iraq and in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf area at this hour. Uh, still, a lot of unconfirmed reports about Iraqi Scud missiles being fired in different directions, mainly at Saudi Arabia and at Bahrain. Uh, there have been no reports whatsoever uh, of uh, missiles heading towards Israel which would seem to be an indication that that main missile site in the uh, western side of Iraq uh, may have received some serious damage tonight uh, in the uh, American offensive and the British and uh, Kuwaiti and Saudi planes that went in as well uh, that took part on the, uh, the operation tonight uh, in Iraq. No indication uh, that there have been anything fired out of that area in the direction uh, of Israel. However, once again, we underlined the word, the word unconfirmed reports on these other missiles uh, the one uh, thing that is being said, though, on every report, uh, unconfirmed or not, is that the missiles that have been fired have not hit any uh, targets. There is no indication of uh, damage from Iraqi missiles at this point. In fact, the only uh, word we're hearing is that oil refinery on the northern tip of Saudi Arabia, where Iraqi artillery apparently inside uh, Kuwait firing across the border has uh, hit and taken a, had a number of direct hits on the oil refinery in Saudi Arabia. Just, uh, General Manson, on this point of uh, uh, prior knowledge, uh, who gets to know something like this, when the decision is, is finally made, uh, we must be talking about a fairly small circle, uh, not too many people inside the loop at that point when the decision is to go. The decision about when to go would be held very, very closely, but inevitably, because this has to be a highly coordinated exercise, a lot of people will be involved in planning various aspects of it. There's a certain amount of compartmentization uh, uh, between the various aspects of planning, uh, but uh, not many people would have the whole picture and very few would know when it's going to take place. Now, on the political side, one assumes uh, that uh, the, the President of the United States would at least talk to the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the Saudi King, uh, and, uh, and uh, apparently the uh, Prime Minister of Canada, but whether he can get to the leaders of all 28 countries in those moments before an attack would... That the United States still has diplomatic relations with Iraq, I heard Bill Plant say that at the State Department, they're still hoping that... Uh, Political instability, for instance, if... They uh, I was notified, called in early this morning, was Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the State Department asked him... Uh, oh. ...night if it struck at night. I mean, can he... The ...states was going to go... For ...even if he has... everything they wanted to. What is strange... Then I guess the, uh, the, the circle of knowledge becomes very quickly much larger. It really does, very quickly, and everyone will be sitting waiting for very specific uh, orders on when to launch, and uh, they'll know in advance what they're supposed to do. There will be no questioning. It'll happen almost automatically. What do you think is going on now in General Schwarzkopf's, uh, uh, I was going to say bunker, I don't know what he's in right now, but wherever he is, what do you assume is going on on his part right now? I think probably the most important thing that's going on right now is an assessment of the first uh, uh, air attack. There will be masses of information coming in as to damage of the targets which have been taken out and which haven't been, and an assessment as to what the next step's going to be, whether to go back with more airplanes and attack those that are still left standing, or whether to uh, move into some new phase of the action. That, uh, the report about the, uh, the Iraqi, uh, let's just look up in Ottawa now, or do we have a... That's, well, here's the Prime Minister, so let's hear what Brian Mulroney has to tell the nation tonight. Speaker, that honorable members will know that military action began in the Persian Gulf today, as announced at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. President Bush called me beforehand to apprise me that he had authorized such action. We understand at the moment that the participants of this first wave included forces from the United States, the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. The fighting is a direct consequence of Saddam Hussein's determination to maintain his brutal occupation and his illegal annexation of Kuwait in defiance of world opinion. He has chosen to ignore the numerous opportunities that were open to him to withdraw. 
He has had 167 days since his illegal and brutal invasion of Kuwait on August 2nd, and 48 full days since the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 678 on November 29th. In all of that time, and with all of the requests, and with all of the appeals from leaders around the world, his answer has been no. Resolution 678 provided a pause for peace and gave Saddam Hussein one final opportunity to comply with the will of the world community as duly expressed through the United Nations. He refused again and again to take that opportunity. Diplomacy has been given every chance to end this conflict peacefully, but regrettably has failed in the face of Saddam Hussein's intransigence. That same intransigence and his indifference to the suffering of his own people made it clear that sanctions alone were not going to force him to leave Kuwait. There hasn't been a single iota of interest on his part in complying with United Nations directives. The time has regrettably come, therefore, to act in the interests of preserving world order and in safeguarding the effectiveness of the United Nations. A failure by the world community, community to act would have undermined the United Nations, turned a blind eye to naked aggression, condoned violations of international law, and encouraged other potential aggressors to defy world opinion in the pursuit of their own criminal ambitions. If Canada had stood aside, we would have betrayed our own national interests, repudiated our own responsibilities, and dishonored our own traditions. Canada did not stand aside in two world wars in Korea. Canada did not stand aside from the hard work of seeking a peaceful end to the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait. And Mr. Speaker, Canada is not standing aside tonight from giving effect to the United Nations resolutions. We have joined with other UN members in expelling Saddam Hussein from Kuwait by force. At this moment, our CF-18s are flying combat air patrol in the northern Persian Gulf, protecting Canadian and allied ships and personnel in the Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. Canadian ships are now engaged in the company of others, playing a vital role in assuring the support of the seaborne arm of the coalition in the Persian Gulf. Earlier this evening, the Cabinet met and gave the Chief of the Defence Staff, General de Chastelin, authority for the Canadian forces to carry out sweep and escort missions over Kuwait and Iraq, if necessary and appropriate. All Canadian forces in the Gulf will nevertheless remain under Canadian command. I profoundly regret, as I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, all members of this House do, that it has come to this. It is with no satisfaction that we take up arms, because war is always a tragedy. But the greater tragedy would have been for criminal aggression to go unchecked. I am sure that the safety of the Canadian servicemen and women in the Gulf is uppermost in the minds of all members. Our hearts go out tonight to those families with loved ones, fathers or mothers, sons and daughters and brothers and sisters on duty in the Persian Gulf. These courageous men and women are braving great danger in the defense of the values and the interests of their entire country. They have our gratitude and our respect and especially tonight our prayers. Now is the time for all Canadians to put aside their differences and rally to their support. I am sure that all honorable members join me and all Canadians in praying that this war end quickly and that all Canadians welcome home our brave fellow citizens who defend freedom and the cause of peace.
Prime Minister now uh, repeating in French the remarks he just made in English. We'll go back to the House of Commons in a few moments' time when the Liberal leader Jean Chrétien, followed by the NDP leader Audrey McLaughlin, will have remarks in response uh, in uh, terms of the military uh, moments in that uh, statement by the Prime Minister explaining that Canadian CF-18 jets are at this hour, I think he described it, flying combat air patrols in the Gulf. That is what they have been doing throughout this uh, process since they first arrived there uh, in the Gulf area last fall. Uh, combat air patrols protecting uh, Canadian ships and other vessels of the multinational force is described as a defensive, uh, um, of a defensive nature as opposed to an offensive nature. Of course, those on the offense tonight were the bombers and fighters of the American, British, Saudi and Kuwaiti forces uh, that flew over Iraq tonight. So the Prime Minister indicating that no role change uh, forecast at this moment for the uh, Canadian forces involved in the multinational force. Now listening closely to the uh, Prime Minister's remarks down in Washington tonight, the CBC's chief political correspondent, David Halton. David's heard all the Prime Minister's speeches on this topic for the past five months. Uh, no indication there of any change uh, in Canada's role, at least up to tonight, David. Uh, no change in the primarily uh, defensive role for the CF-18s, as you say, for the 24 Canadian CF-18s in the Gulf, Peter. I was very struck by the very forceful uh, way the Prime Minister made a point that he's made before in previous speeches, and that is that Canada cannot stand on the sidelines of this multinational United Nations mission. He stated that very strongly. He almost seemed to be uh, throwing down a challenge to the opposition parties now to bury their opposition to uh, uh, this war against Iraq and to join the government in supporting uh, what he has always said is essentially a United uh, Nations, not a United States uh, mission. It's interesting that he, he did make that point very strongly. He appealed to the opposition parties to put aside their differences. Here in Washington, George Mitchell, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, is calling reporters together tomorrow and is almost certainly expected to say that he is fully supporting the president at this time. Mitchell, of course, had opposed uh, uh, an offensive action against Iraq. He'd been in support of uh, giving more time to sanctions, but uh, just a few hours ago, he said that uh, in time of war, that he would support the person he described as his commander-in-chief, President Bush. Well, David, we're yet to hear from Jean Chrétien or Audrey McLaughlin, but some indications, at least uh, by some of their caucus members, uh, that now is the time to uh, rally around the uh, Canadian military effort in the Gulf in spite of their strong objections which they have voiced uh, uh, over the past few days during the debate in the House of Commons. It is worth noting, I, I don't know what uh, Chrétien or, or uh, McLaughlin are going to say, we'll have to wait to hear from them themselves, uh, but it is interesting to note that uh, the Ontario Premier Bob Ray tonight in a fairly uh, uh, tough uh, comment on this uh, action tonight condemning the United States attack on Iraq uh, just hours after the bombing began, saying that sanctions, sanctions should have been given more time. And Ray's words, uh, quoting here, is this a cause for which I would be willing to go to the desert and fight for? The answer is no, unquote. Bob Ray, the Ontario well, Premier. Well, that's a very strong statement, Peter, and it's going to be fascinating to watch Jean Chrétien now in the hours ahead uh, and tomorrow because he's been so categorical in his opposition to this war. He's put the Liberal Party very much out on a limb, even further than the air raid shelter after the Scud missile warning. The report we heard from David Green, CBS News cameraman David Green, a little earlier on that there were attacks on, on the Saudi refineries up north and that the Saudi troops who were guarding the refineries were heading south. Unfortunately, this comes as no surprise either way. We've been watching the Iraqis. One of the salient questions from the beginning of the operation has been, how would the Iraqis react when they're under fire? Well, it's too early to have an answer to that. Another question was, how will the Saudi troops react? The Saudis who we are giving billions of dollars of arms to, selling billions of dollars of arms to. It seems like we might begin to have, have an answer to that. It seems like they begin to flee, that, that they began to flee even before the attack really began. Dan? Bob Simon in Saudi Arabia. CBS News coverage of war in the Gulf. will continue in a moment. The support of, an, uh, of, the, of the conservatives. I also understood that a number of uh, liberals uh, certainly applauded him as, as you know, with the missile bases in western Iraq pointed at Israel that they have in fact been destroyed. Uh, no indication that any missiles uh, got out of the ground at that part of, uh, from Iraq. The other point we should mention, uh, though, that there is ground resistance coming from the Iraqi forces uh, in, uh, in uh, Kuwait. 
if we can just have that uh, uh, map up of the area where the uh, oil field is that uh, where there have been problems uh, for the yeah that's the one there see in the northern part of Saudi Arabia the uh, Kafki oil field and oil refinery in northern Saudi Arabia uh, the reports that we have been uh, getting uh, have indicated that from southern Kuwait artillery fire coming across the border and there have been a number of direct hits on that Saudi oil refinery tonight that as far as we know aside from anti-aircraft fire is the major point of uh, a direct hit resistance uh, from the Iraqis tonight although these reports continue unconfirmed as they are about Scud missile launches from Iraq into Saudi Arabia here are the confirmed damage areas that uh, we know of at this hour those missile bases in western Iraq pointed at Israel uh, we are told from a number of different sources that they have been destroyed and a number of bases around uh, uh, Baghdad the capital of Iraq uh, missile bases air bases uh, chemical and nuclear weapons factories uh, not nuclear weapons but uh, the potential for nuclear bombs much uh, talk of course about whether or not Iraq is nuclear capable number of reports today indicating that some uh, uh, very low level kind of uh, nuclear capability was in Iraq and could be transported but uh, those reports uh, like so many other things on a day like this uh, very much unconfirmed however you heard both the president of the United States and also the uh, uh, the defense secretary and the uh, joint chiefs of staff chairman talking about um, the damage that was done now we're going back up to Ottawa now because Prime Minister has finished his remarks and the liberal leader Jean Chrétien uh, we expect now about to give his uh, response to the Prime Minister's remarks and to the events of this night. The Honourable Leader of the United States. Even though the Americans win a decisive military victory, he might still gain the mantle which he has been searching for, which is the mantle of Arab leadership. On the other hand, at, here in the early stages, the Defense Department says, uh, quote, things are going very, very well. There is, at least for this hour, the prospect of an early end to the war and a complete triumph, a complete victory for the United States and allied uh, forces. That would leave uh, Saddam Hussein uh, as disgraced in the sense that he taunted uh, the tiger that is the United States and its allied forces and completely lost. That's right, Dan. If, if allied dreams come true, if this war will be over, oh, in a matter of days or, or, or a short week, and there are not too many Iraqi civilian casualties and the nuclear potential is erased and the chemical potential is erased Saddam Hussein ceases to exist as a, as, a, as an Arab leader it means that that it was sheer folly he will he will lose respect and the Americans will gain respect as the people who are who are worthy of, 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 of their mantle as the the world's only superpower Fuad Ajami is uh, joining us here Bob Simon uh, in our studio Fuad uh, among the powers who mentioned the Iranians the Syrians the Israelis uh, and the Jordanians. Yes. Egypt and Turkey both are watching this situation very carefully. Well, the Egyptians really wanted an end into the Gulf because they haven't been a Gulf power. And the Saudis have a, had in the past a certain allergy uh, to the Egyptians being present uh, in, in the affairs of the Gulf, but they will have it now. Uh, excuse me for interrupting you, but uh, Dateline Bahrain, that's one of the small states along the Persian Gulf, of course, Iraqi missiles were detected heading for an area around Bahrain and eastern Saudi Arabia early Thursday morning. That would be Persian Gulf time, uh, late night uh, U.S. Eastern time. But this report from Bahrain says that the Iraqi missiles, these are the dreaded scuds, fell short of their targets. Bahrainian authorities said, and I quote, missiles were detected, but they fell short, unquote. A U.S. embassy official in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, denied that any Scud missiles had actually reached Saudi Arabia. Now, there were earlier reports, never confirmed, but reports from uh, usually reliable sources that some Scud missiles had been fired in the direction of Saudi Arabia. The U.S. Embassy says none of them reached. And I quote now uh, from a U.S. Embassy official in Riyadh, there is nothing at all to these reports. It's a false alarm. There is no damage at all in Saudi Arabia. Nothing has been hit, quote, unquote. Uh, one must assume he means uh, nothing has been hit by Scud missiles because we know the one refinery just below the Kuwaiti border along the Persian Gulf has been hit by Iraqi artillery. Our, our cameraman David Green uh, gave us an eyewitness report to that. Air raid warnings were sounded in Bahrain uh, in addition to Saudi Arabia earlier this evening in response to the missile warning from military officials, but the all clear sounded in Bahrain shortly after that. 
uh, five scuds were reported by the British Broadcasting Corporation uh, to have been fired uh, from Iraq in the general direction of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, but there are no, repeat, no confirmed reports that those scuds ever reached uh, anywhere near their targets. So far as can be uh, known at this hour, the uh, tremendous U.S. and allied air attack against Iraqi forces inside Iraq and in Kuwait is uh, continuing. These major developments uh, so far tonight, in addition, U.S. officials give the attacks uh, excellent reviews so far. President Bush says he had no choice but to give the order to attack, and he said the offensive would not fail. That's a direct quote from him, noting that so far no ground forces on either side have been engaged in combat. No word on any casualties yet, but Defense Secretary Richard Cheney said the indications are what he called hopeful about casualties. Baghdad has been hit by airstrikes. The Iraqis retaliate with the hit on that Saudi refinery that I mentioned a moment ago. President Bush addressed the nation from the Oval Office, and this is part of what he said. Well, unfortunately, the tape didn't come up for us, but basically what the president said, uh, that uh, he, in effect, had no choice to do what he did, but that he was hopeful it would be very uh, short. CBS News coverage of war in the Gulf continues. Not only one of the most. Any terrorist activity in Metro are being taken seriously. Our force is working in conjunction with. To ask, to urge the Prime Minister. And the country, uh, there is very vigorous operation from churches throughout the country. squadron of tornadoes been there from almost uh, day one. They came in right after the uh, first tactical air wing uh, went on the ground. And of course, the British from a political and a military point of view, both have been America's strongest allies in that part of the world. First Margaret Thatcher and then her successor, John Major, making it clear that they believe absolutely that force may be necessary and that they were willing to stand beside the United States in that uh, operation that was cobbled together out there. Uh, some of you have been concerned that Arthur Kent and Mike Betcher might be giving away American positions. Uh, in fact, that military base is where the American military put uh, the media so that they could be reporting as they have been from August on. It, it is an enormous complex there. Uh, the Iraqis will not uh, learn of its location based on the reports here. They have had to know about it from the day one of August 2nd from their invasion when that was the massive staging area for the United States forces. It was there that most of the troops flew into. It was there that the fighters were put on the ground. It has been from there that most of the activity has started in Saudi Arabia when it comes to American military forces. So we are not in any way breaching security tonight by telling people that uh, there's this big air base at Dahran. And in fact, it is one of the most secure areas in northern Saudi Arabia for that very reason. It's also a big, big port. In Israel at this hour is retired General Shlomo Gazet. He's the former head of Israeli intelligence. He's standing by in our studios. It's early morning there. General, it does appear that uh, in the first hours at least, that Israel's uh, being in harm's way, that the danger now has been substantially diminished. Is that your assessment? Uh, very much so, yes. Uh, of course, it's too early to know if all missiles that can hit, that could reach Tel Aviv and Israel, have been destroyed. But at least for the time being, it seems that uh, the first strike has been very successful from our point of view. When you were listening to General Colin Powell, and if you did not hear him, I will tell you what he said. He said that Saddam Hussein himself was not a target in this first wave, that they were going after command and control. But in your judgment, can the United States allow Saddam Hussein to live? Well, uh, I, that, I don't think that that really is the issue. The, the issue is what kind of a regime will be in Iraq the day after the war. And if Saddam uh, Hussein will remain as an exile somewhere in uh, Libya, I don't think anybody would care very much about that. And at least from a military point of view, the war should be managed in a way f in the best possible military way and not to concentrate any unnecessary effort or forces against Saddam in person. General Gazette, have you been surprised that based on what we're hearing so far at least, that the Iraqi defense and counterstrike capacity has been so ineffective? Uh, yes, not over surprised. I, I never thought too much of the Iraqi capabilities, but to be that bad is a little bit surprising. 
Uh, I, I, <clears throat> one of the problems is that people are taken by Iraqi rhetorics. And by their rhetorics, you, you could have thought that they are at least lions and giants and whatever it is. And now they have to face the reality. What about the fears of terrorism in your part of the world after this and in other parts of the world as well? Uh, yes, I expect there will be some acts of terrorism. I think that this too should be taken with a pinch of salt. I don't think that we should be over uh, worried about uh, terrorist capabilities. Uh, we know their capabilities, they're very limited. It may be painful, of course, from an individual point of view, but I, I don't think it's a world menace. Thank you very much, uh, General Shlomo Gazet, retired general, former head of Israeli intelligence. Thanks very much for being with us tonight. Israel still, of course, is very much uh, at the crossroads in the Middle East, but it's breathing somewhat easier tonight because there has been no Iraqi attack on the state of Israel as promised by Tariq Aziz when he was in Geneva last week, should an attack be launched against his country. NBC's John Cochran remains at his post at the White House right now. The president making decisions at this late hour, John? He has this late hour. He has just authorized the secretary of the Energy Department to draw down and distribute the strategic petroleum oil reserve, most of which is stored down in salt dome caverns down in Louisiana. Now, this is just a standby thing. It shouldn't create any panic. At this point, we don't believe the Iraqis have in any way disrupted, for example, the, the Saudi oil fields, the production from there. But this is a, a prudent thing to do, that word often associated with George Bush. This was something agreed to by the major industrialized nations uh, several weeks ago. They all agreed that they would do this. Some of them have strategic petroleum reserves and some don't. The United States does. The Japanese, for example, uh, obviously don't. They're not an oil-producing country. This, of course, would help stabilize oil prices, stabilize gasoline prices. Uh, it would, uh, if nothing else, it should allay some fears among uh, American consumers, Tom. Uh, John Cochran, uh, what about the president addressing the whole matter of energy conservation in this country? He has been a reluctant spokesman in that regard in terms of taking an active lead in the early stages of this investment. But, Baghdad. there is a war. Today, 1,000 of them might have been stuck on the Iraqi side of the border over the last few days. We cannot confirm that. But at the moment, the Jordanians uh, are very concerned about being flooded with refugees, and I don't think they John, will open the gates to them, at least not for the next several days. John, in the last five and a half months, we have seen more fervent pro-Saddam Hussein sentiment uh, from Palestinians in Jordan than anywhere else. And it is quite possible the Jordanians are going to get out of bed just about now and find out that he has suffered a tremendous blow now you used to live in Amman you've served there a lot recently how do you think they're going to react my sense is that Jordanians are probably going to oh, cope thanks. with this that they are they are going to absorb it uh, Jordanians have spoken with already who I must say are are people who are at the uh, educated level of society and therefore somewhat more moderate in their behavior and words uh, are already saying well at least it's over uh, and now we'll see what happens. However, people with probably less at stake in life, uh, primarily uh, Palestinians in refugee camps who are living in, in such terrible conditions, are very likely to be angry and very likely at least to want to go out and demonstrate. I'm not so sure the Jordanian security forces are going to want to allow that. Uh, the sense here is that there will be some level of civil disturbance, but that it can be controlled and probably is not a threat to at all to the to the regime uh, and the question of whether American targets here could be hit by mobs has come up every it's in everyone's mind but the general impression is probably that is controllable we did notice tonight uh, it was it was uh, well right. past midnight here when the attack began that the lights went on in the US Embassy and that embassy staff arrived very quickly after the attack began many of them carrying what appeared to be overnight bags with out, however, giving the impression that they were planning to leave the country, but more that they were preparing to hunker down in case, ne in case it would prove necessary inside the embassy. Thank you, John. We have had contact with people there. They seem quite calm and are telling us uh, absolutely, categorically, they are not planning to evacuate. They are also indicating they seem to feel that the situation is at the moment in control and controllable, although all of us are waiting to see what happens in an hour when the sun comes up and people turn on their radios and get the news. Thank you, John. Past experience is any example, including during Black September in 1970 when the King and the Palestinians fought a vicious civil war. People in the American Embassy then were always 
well protected by the Jordanian establishment, namely the Jordanian army and the Mahabharat, the uh, Jordanian secret service. It may also be, are you still with us, John Donovan? Yes, I am. It may also be uh, that given the political support the Palestinians have given King Hussein as well as Saddam Hussein, that the king will be obliged to tolerate, if not, uh, not encourage, but certainly tolerate a measure of political, uh, you call it disturbance, but outpouring of support for Saddam Hussein today. I would think it depends on what form it takes. I'm, I'm certain that the king will allow peaceful demonstrations. He has for the last several months. We saw another one just a few days ago. They have been very moderate. Uh, the, the language, the rhetoric has been uh, quite fierce, but the actual uh, physical Different. manifestation has been quite moderate. People marching peacefully, usually to a stadium, and then making speeches there. I would imagine that if that's what people have in mind, the king will almost certainly allow that. But I don't, I don't think he in any way will tolerate even a threatening move by a crowd towards the U.S. Embassy. Okay. Uh, that has been attempted in vague form over the last 10 months when various issues have angered uh, Palestinians about U.S. policy. And always, always, the king puts troops between uh, the demonstrators and the U.S. Embassy. Do I assume, I John, you're in the... That he wouldn't want to change policy. Do I assume, John, you're in the Intercontinental Hotel? Yes, about uh, 100 yards away from the embassy. That's exactly you're right across the road from it. So if anything happens to the American Embassy in Amman, John Donovan will be the first to uh, tell us about it. Um, just a couple of other points about Jordan, which are not particularly relevant to the moment, but there has been an enormously high state of alert uh, on the Jordanian-Israeli border with the largest deployment of Jordanian forces in many years down there. But if the early stages uh, of the reporting are accurate from, and I sure, don't doubt them, from Dean Reynolds quoting Israeli military intelligence that the Iraqi missiles, which had the capability of attacking, uh, being launched at Israel from Iraq, uh, 250, 260 miles away, then the general tension or the general temperature, the political and military temperature in the Jordan Valley, uh, which Israel and Jordan share and dispute, uh, will likely go down. There are those in Jordan and elsewhere in the Arab world and here at home who say that Saddam Hussein does not have to win a war to become a hero. Not necessarily does he even have to win a war to remain preeminent in the Arab world if he is not personally destroyed or his immediate political apparatus is not destroyed. Joining us again is uh, our regular Middle East analyst, Judith Kipper. What do you think about that? I think that's right, Peter. I think that there is a chance that if he stays alive during this war, and there is frustration and staff members Minister of Israel who's standing by. Uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, are you there? Yes, I can hear you. We understand earlier, of course, a national emergency was declared in Israel. What is the status of events there now? Well, uh, as you know, Israel is not involved in this conflict, uh, but we follow the events uh, very closely. We uh, wish the American and coalition forces Godspeed and full success in achieving their mission, and we hope that they'll come home safely, all of them, and quickly. Have you received any reports about uh, possible destruction of Iraqi uh, missiles along the western border? Well, we heard the uh, uh, statements that have come through various uh, uh, communication lines and news media and so on, but this is very early on in the uh, operations. We are waiting, like everyone else, uh, I believe like the American government, uh, for um, uh, precise reports following the accomplishment of the missions. Has, has the alert status therein, your country, diminished at all given these first waves of, of bombings? No, we have uh, uh, long experience in this and we know that this is, uh, we listened to the American statements that this could be a long uh, engagement. Uh, we have made the preparations in the, for the, our population. We've uh, asked them to take certain precautions, asked the people to stay in their homes uh, for the moment. Uh, so we have not relaxed our uh, state of alert, but we follow things, as I said, very closely and wish the American and other forces uh, uh, full success. Well, as morning has come to Israel, what steps will you take now in regard to the population, notifying them about events? They're, they're all notified. Our, our uh, communication lines, uh, our television, our radio are now uh, broadcasting instructions to the people basically to stay home or around their homes. Uh, the schools, as you know, are closed. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, now basically taking the gas masks out of their kits uh, so people are ready just in case uh, uh, something does happen. We hope that it won't, but we're ready if it will. And what about the status of the Israeli military, the alert status at present? Well, the military is ready uh, for any contingency. We hope that none will be necessary. What about the reaction of the Palestinians in the territories? Are you worried at all about that? 
Well, we uh, did hear some uh, 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 communications, communiques from the Intifada leadership uh, that is directed by the PLO to side with Saddam Hussein to attack uh, Israeli targets and so on, and to use the opportunity of the, of the crisis to do so. Uh, we've said to the Palestinian population at large, not to these uh, uh, handful of insiders and, uh, and terrorists, uh, that we will protect them. But we will, of course, uh, take action against the, uh, those who will violate it. So far, we've not really had to. Mr. Netanyahu, thank you for joining us. That's very good. His party would support the Canadian government and Canadian forces in a time of war, which there was never any question he would have any choice about that, and Mr. Kretchen's advisors should have known that. You think he's managed to paper over the cracks for the time being then? Is that what has happened here? Well, I think he has, yes. Uh, but uh, there is a great deal of bitterness inside the Liberal caucus. And though I don't know for sure why, perhaps that... Uh, price situation to take advantage of this uh, beyond what is fair. The fact is that we have all been told by everyone in the industry that there is adequate supply, that we do not have any... He was prepared to go. Are you... What's the word? Not please, but are you satisfied? Uh, Iraqi aircraft that weren't able to get into the air or chose not to go flying during the dark hours will be taking off and going after those very um, high-value naval targets such as the uh, uh, U.S. carriers that are located in the Gulf right now, and that probably means action for our cf 18 Well, there has been no indication yet that the Iraqi Air Force has even gone off the ground tonight. Not a, not a single indication of that yet uh, by all the reports we've received. Okay, just briefly, uh, how prepared are C our CF-18 pilots for this uh, new role? I think they're uh, quite well prepared for it because it is an air defense role. The object is to go and use their radar, identify uh, enemy aircraft, uh, go after them and get them out of the sky, which is basically the role they're flying over the Gulf. In that case, they're sitting and waiting for the um, aircraft to come uh, into their territory, whereas in sweep and escort, they'll move out uh, over enemy territory with the attacking raid. All right, let me just briefly uh, update uh, viewers on the situation for the Canadian forces in the Gulf tonight. The CF-18 jets are still patrolling the northern part of the Gulf. The bases at Bahrain, alongside the Gulf, and also at Qatar, are on a state of alert. Soldiers have been ordered to don chemical suits. Reporters have been sealed off away from the bases, uh, but there is no indication that either base is in, at this moment, uh, under any attack from Iraqi forces. We'll have more in a moment on this special edition of the National Journal coverage of the Gulf War. this war effort uh, terminates quickly, uh, I think that would be a positive development for the economy. If it stretches out, uh, it does come at a bad time, and we shouldn't fool ourselves about that. Okay, Donald Regal, the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. Tom, we've also had a statement from uh, Senator Sam Nunn, who said that he was briefed after the attack by Secretary Cheney, and that uh, all indications are that the, the chief targets are all of the missile installations, the uh, is Iraqi aircraft, anti-aircraft installations, and that uh, he is hopeful that the massive bombing will take care and uh, ward off any counterattack. By the way, Senator Regal, you said that you had heard that the amount of tonnage was uh, how much? About 18,000 tons is what uh, we've uh, gotten some indication of. That would be an amount in total equal to the Hiroshima explosion uh, of the atomic bomb in World War II. So there's been a tremendous amount of uh, air power uh, striking these uh, selected targets and uh, I think as the sun comes up over there you're going to start on the periphery of uh, missile range from Iraq uh, but the uh, the pilots uh, of the CF-18s have now uh, should uh, the chief of defense staff see fit to uh, to give it to them have been uh, given clearance to carry out sweep and escort missions in a theater of war those clearly are the people most at risk uh, from Canada's point of view uh, as the as the war continues. Before we, uh, before we leave you, Doug, we have a couple of guests here in Toronto, but before we do, uh, now that we have heard uh, the statements of all three leaders, uh, what uh, can you do in terms of previewing uh, the transactions in, uh, in Parliament tomorrow? Yes, uh, thank you, Mike. There's, ve there's uh, very little left to do now. The uh, Parliament will still has still to vote on, on the resolution that brought MPs back early from the Christmas vacations, a resolution that would re reaffirm support uh, for the uh, UN resolution uh, that would... Uh, that we'll see as the day goes on here. Uh, it uh, 
should be pointed out, however, that in addition to the American attack force, Canadian intelligence officials told me before I left Canada that there's essentially a fence of uh, fighter missiles, or of, of fighters along the border of southern Iraq. These, these fighters are up constantly doing circuits along the entire border, supported by tanker planes and backed up again by so-called AWACS, air traffic control planes. So they form a kind of fence against any kind of assault from the uh, Iraqi fighters. The question now is, is the, uh, is the American attack going to continue in daylight? And how much opposition will it encounter? How much of the Iraqi Air Force was destroyed? Well, our understanding here, George, is that uh, the initial attack is over. Uh, four or five waves of uh, bombers uh, uh, went forward over Baghdad, specifically, and presumably over uh, uh, northern and uh, central Iraq and Kuwait. Uh, we understand that, that they are now returning to base uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so we should have some indication fairly soon of uh, the rest of the information, that is, the casualties, uh, how successful the operation. But uh, for what it's worth, Dick Cheney is saying that uh, they encountered very little resistance, which uh, some people find rather hard to believe. I think one of the uh, factors in uh, the resistance being so low was mentioned uh, by Les Aspen in a broadcast I monitored from Washington. He's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. In the course of preparing for war with the Soviet Union, the Americans developed a very, very sophisticated electronic jamming capability. And they've turned that capability through uh, an aircraft I mentioned before in a telephone conversation, the F-4 Wild Weasel, they've turned that jamming capability against Saddam Hussein's much more primitive communications network. And the, the feeling is that, uh, that Saddam runs a very, very centralized command system. And if they've been able to put Saddam in a position where he can't pick up a telephone and tell his people what to do, then chaos may very well be reigning in his armed forces. So, uh, at, on the surface at least, this looks like uh, a first stage victory in, uh, the, in an electronic battle. It, uh, it may be a triumph of technology. The Americans have had some terrible, terrible experiences uh, relying on technology and the weapon systems they've developed. You re may remember the last attack on Muammar Gaddafi, in which I think only two of all of the intended targets were hit in spite of all the night vision and the smart bombs and everything else. In this case, it may be that the technology has finally come through for them. We did hear tonight from uh, the reporters uh, working from a hotel room in Baghdad that uh, from their understanding, these uh, bombs were hitting their targets, uh, pinpoint, uh, and there was, uh, there was uh, very little uh, loose, uh, uh, loose shelling around. Uh, does that make sense based upon what you've been hearing over there? It's, uh, it's credible. Uh, we hear so much confident talk from the American military sources in, the, in, in advance of uh, an actual attack about the capability of the weapons. Uh, one can only be doubtful and a little bit cynical, but uh, the capabilities described are fantastic, and uh, from the reports we've heard from Baghdad, it sounds like this time they've lived up to it. They have shown pinpoint accuracy. They have been able to knock out the communication system. They have been able to hit the... Uh, the missile installations. That's, that's the early indication. We'll see next what's happened to the Iraqi Air Force. George, uh, you uh, probably have heard already that there's been a change in engagement so far as Canadian forces are concerned. Uh, they can now go on the offensive uh, in escort and combat capacities with uh, multinational forces. Has there been any response to that over there? I haven't heard any uh, response to that. Uh, being in Saudi Arabia, there are very few uh, Canadian officials here, and uh, most of them are uh, oil workers uh, from, the, from the Alberta oil patch, and uh, they've uh, naturally enough gone to ground. Uh, they were given their gas masks a couple of days ago, and, uh, and they're keeping a low profile, so I, I can't give you any official reaction on the change in the Canadian strategy. All right, George, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be in contact with you as time goes on, of course. It's, uh, now morning over there. What is the time actually in uh, Dharain at this at this moment? The time in Dharan is exactly uh, 6:55 a.m. and uh, the uh, sun has been up for about 45 minutes. It's overcast, which I might add uh, creates another uh, uh, attack potential. It's possible in these kinds of conditions. You may have heard that B-52s were brought in to be part of the action. No, we hadn't heard possible that. Under the Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, sure. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They were they were brought into the area, right. and it's now possible that they could be brought into the into the action uh, with the cloud cover protecting them. They can 
they can drop carpet bombing, as they call it, from uh, several miles in the air and attack ground positions if they choose with such a heavy cloud cover. So that may be a factor. George, thank you very much. We'll be back to you. Thank you. George Wolfe. Uh, Baghdad Radio tonight has been broadcasting uh, recitations from the Muslim Holy Koran uh, since shortly after the Allies attacked Iraq and Iraqi occupied Kuwait. The Turkish semi-official Anatolian news agency uh, said the Iraqi radio station had not so far mentioned the air raids and this communique uh, moved about an hour ago. Uh, Iraqi missiles, this is the report, were detected heading for an area around Bahrain but as you've heard from George Wolf, uh, it would seem that they uh, didn't get anywhere near their target. Um, Pamela Wallen is back there in our uh, situation room. Uh, Pamela, we were talking about the uh, response from the politicians in Canada, but perhaps it's back to uh, time to go back now just for a brief wrap-up of what has gone on this evening uh, in front of the big map there. I think if we can do that, and, and perhaps if uh, we can start, we have Nick Stetham with us, uh, Brian McDonald, and Brigadier General uh, Taggart, and I, and I think if we could start now, because obviously concerning most Canadians at this point is the rules of engagement for Canadians have changed. Brian McDonald, show us where they are and where they might now be at this point. Well, at this point, of course, our aircraft are in the area of the Persian Gulf. To this point, they based have been... Based in Qatar. Based in Qatar and patrolling in the area to mm -hmm. the north of Qatar. Their role up to this point has been a defensive role, protecting the shipping, the Allied ships in the Gulf. The rules of engagement, in a sense, can be described as don't fire unless you're fired on. Right. It would appear now that the rules of engagement have been changed, and our aircraft can now open fire the minute they see any hostile aircraft. There's also the sense that they have now been authorized to expand their role from purely defensive to supporting operations in the area of Kuwait. Okay, so we call that now sweep and escort duties. What exactly does that mean? If we can, they can, they can go in by themselves? Or are they always traveling with other uh, allied troops at this point, other allied planes? Well, let me defer to, in okay. fact, our Air Force General, General who can <laughs> give the really... Well, Pamela, the escort duties will be escorting bomber and attack aircraft into uh, to carpet bomb, do it, providing mm -hmm. high cover. The uh, Canadians uh, are, are world-renowned for their capability in air-to-air -air combat, and they'll be, you know, be a protective force. I would doubt that we have uh, large numbers of weapons that would be suitable for, uh, for use against ground-based targets. The uh, sweep missions will be uh, individual orders against particular targets that are annoying, a nuisance to the operational commander, and because he doesn't have coordinated forces to use against them, he will then probably task the uh, Canadians to assume that role. Nick Stetham, do you think, as uh, Craig was suggesting earlier, that we may have to send in more CF-18s at this point? We've got 24 in, about 350 people based in Qatar. Are we going to have to beef that, beef that up now that we're seeing active duty? I think that'll become clearer over the next couple of days, and I think the government will have to take a decision then. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, if the air war is going to continue, I think it's highly likely we will have to send in more aircraft. If it looks like the ground war is going to be difficult, that it is going to use up formations because we forget that the formations that are there now are going to go into battle and then they're going to have to be taken out and rebuilt and other formations go in in their place. If that situation appears uh, likely, then we have to look at the possibility of sending a brigade. Are we going to see Canadian casualties? Yes, we are, if particularly if we send a brigade in. And it actually takes a, an operational role in the ground war. In terms of our forces there, we don't have that many pilots up. We may, again, I defer to General Taggart, lose an aircraft or so, but they will not be heavy casualties on the air side. Yeah, I think the point has to be made, Pamela, as we sit here discussing this, people are dying on both sides. At this point. At this point, and certainly some of them very well may be Canadians and personal friends and sons and daughters of my friends. The mm -hmm. price that they're paying is, is a very expensive one, and it's, we're paying for the neglect of the Middle East situation for turning a deaf ear to the Arabs and, and, and their complaints over the years, and now it's, uh, it's resulted in this war. And the one in peace does return, I hope that we remember what the price was. All right, we are in, I guess if we can quote Saddam Hussein at this point, the mother of all battles. The information we are getting tonight is extremely one-sided. We are hearing from the multinational force, basically from the American force at this point, but we are told that wave after wave after wave of fighters have gone into Iraq the entire country of Iraq, probably into Kuwait as well. 
can we assess what kind of damage they might have been able to accomplish in those five raids that they have conducted tonight that we know about? We'll start with you. Well, we can't assess sitting here because we haven't had the opportunity to see what the results of those strikes. We know that the strikes went in successfully, that they met very fragmented and weak defenses, mm -hmm. but it still requires now the reconnaissance satellites to give the total coverage so that the analysts can right. say, okay, this is exactly what has been destroyed to this point. And we may find that, in fact, regardless of the fact that the operation went successfully, that the actual damage is much less than we think at this point. Nick Stephan, you've spoken to that point, that when people sit in hotel rooms and the observers are few at this point, watching a bomb go off, it looks like all hell has broken loose, but in terms of real impact, it may be minimal. Yes, I think the best example of that that everyone would be familiar with is downtown Beirut. Mm -hmm. And if we think about the bombing and the shelling that has gone on in Beirut over a decade and a half, and then look at the people who still live there, the people mm -hmm. who survive right in the center of that battle. Okay, a couple of questions, too, that we should pick up on at this point. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Defense Secretary Dick Cheney saying at this point that the air response from Iraq was very minimal. Uh, in fact, at one early point, he said there had been no response. Uh, how do we interpret that at this point if we take... I guess as a given for now, and we might find that this is uh, this changes later. But if that's if that's the facts, why aren't we seeing a response from Iraq? Yeah, I would assume that the uh, command and control systems have been uh, annihilated or decapitated, mm -hmm. and that we are, are seeing the impact of that. I would also expect that the the daylight hours will bring a return of the uh, Iraqi air force if it's still intact. The real horror will probably begin in about 24 hours from now when the carpet bombing begins in the use of aerosol explosives. All right, we'll have to stop you there and return you to Lloyd Robertson at the main desk. Thank you, Pamela. Just a note here which uh, has just been handed to me. It uh, is from a source uh, in uh, Washington that indicates that uh, the entire Iraqi Air Force was uh, decimated in that U.S.-led attack and much of President Saddam Hussein's elite Republican Guard was destroyed. Uh, that comes actually from the uh, cable news network and that is quoting Pentagon sources. Now, those of you tuning in for the news at this stage in Eastern Canada, this is, in fact, the news tonight. We're in the midst of our uh, special coverage of the Gulf War. What we're going to try to do in the next half hour is give you a recap of the events of this historic evening. So those of you in the West, stay with us because you'll be watching the news in the East, which will bring you a full summary of what's gone on over these past four and a bit incredible hours. Let's hear it. That's how it sounded just hours ago in Baghdad as wave after wave of American jet fighter bombers swooped in to attack the city and the heart of Saddam Hussein's rule. The Gulf War is on. It began shortly after 2.30 in the morning Baghdad time as the Americans began their attack. American jets were destroying or trying to destroy the installations that could be used to launch Iraq's Scud missiles with chemical, biological, or even nuclear warheads. They also hit an oil refinery and the Baghdad airport and aimed for Iraq's military headquarters. And the night sky over the city lit up with anti-aircraft fire as the Iraqis fought back. As the attack took place, correspondent Peter Arnett of CNN was reporting live from the Al Rashid Hotel overlooking Baghdad, along with reporter Bernard Shaw. Here's how it sounded. Yeah, it's, uh, it's beginning to get quiet again, Peter. Yes, John, on the other side of the hotel, it's a little noisier. Just uh, two minutes ago, there were three enormous explosions that one after the other within seconds. I have no idea what the target was, but they shook the hotel on that side. So these bombing raids are continuing now, wave after wave, and uh, the intensity has been maintained. I've noticed that the Iraqis have uncorked uh, new kinds of uh, anti-aircraft weapons. I don't know what they are, but they, they appear to be heavier they, caliber, they are spurting they? fire into the sky, heavier caliber. I, I don't know what they are, but they are more impressive than that used earlier. They're obviously uncorking uh, other uh, extra anti-aircraft defenses as this battle progresses. Just one comment. Clearly, I've never been there, but this feels like we're in the center of hell. 
The Americans say the raid went very well. There is no word on casualties, and the U.S. military says Operation Desert Shield has now been renamed Operation Desert Storm. This first attack of the Gulf War was carried out mainly by U.S. F-15 fighter bombers. Sources say they were accompanied by a squadron of British Tornado ground attack aircraft. The American jets could be seen and heard taking off throughout the night from Saudi Arabia. The F-15 is one of the best fighters the Americans have and one of the best in the world. The version used tonight is known as the Eagle. It's modified for use against ground targets such as air defense installations, as well as air-to-air -air combat. It carries missiles and bombs and can be loaded with extra fuel tanks for long flights, such as the mission tonight to Baghdad. The BBC reports that Iraq launched five of its Scud missiles at Saudi Arabia and authorities in Bahrain say Iraqi missiles were detected but fell short of their targets. In Washington tonight, the White House said the liberation of Kuwait has begun and President George Bush went on national television in the United States to report on the attack. He said Saddam Hussein rejected all reasonable efforts to find peace and the Allies had no choice but to push him out of Kuwait by force. Saddam was warned over and over again to comply with the will of the United Nations, leave Kuwait or be driven out. Saddam has arrogantly rejected all warnings. Instead, he tried to make this a dispute between Iraq and the United States of America. Well, he failed. Tonight, 28 nations, countries from five continents, Europe and Asia, Africa and the Arab League, have forces in the Gulf area standing shoulder to shoulder against Saddam Hussein. These countries had hoped the use of force could be avoided. Regrettably, we now believe that only force will make him leave. With me is our Washington correspondent, Robert Hurst. Uh, Bob, uh, the world has been on tenderhooks all day. Did this surprise many people that the raid came at this particular time? Well, the White House had always said sooner rather than later, so I don't think it did surprise many people. Uh, Lloyd, I can give you a quick update on what the Pentagon is saying now in terms of the success of the operation four hours after it began. They are essentially saying mission accomplished. Um, in terms of casualties, the Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, uh, said they were very, very encouraged. And late report out of the Pentagon says there were no American or any Allied aircraft lost. That's quite incredible, uh, Bob. Uh, some people have difficulty believing uh, the weakness of the Iraqi defenses tonight. Um, are there any reports coming from anywhere else that indicate uh, the Iraqis put up any kind of a fight at all? Well, just, uh, Lloyd, when you say it's difficult believing, I report it because that's what the Pentagon is saying. I think we should be skeptical, however, because it is coming out of one side, and this is the first day of the war, and it is important in the first day of the war to put the best foot forward. Uh, are there any other reports of anything coming out? Apparently, the Pentagon says the only thing that the American and the Allied pilots encountered was artillery from the ground. They say that no Iraqi aircraft got off the ground at all. What is the next stage in this strategy? Don't know what the next stage in the strategy is, and the Pentagon is not saying. There had been some suggestion that perhaps there would be a pause of bombing uh, after two or three days. Now, we're only into this for four hours. Uh, as your panel has said, uh, when the light shines now in the Saudi desert or in the battlefield, they perhaps may be uh, another attack from Iraq, or a counterattack, rather, from Iraq. Thank you very much, Bob. We'll talk to you later. Okay, Lloyd. Robert Hurst in Washington. Prime Minister Brian Mulroney said tonight that the attack on Baghdad was the direct consequence of Saddam Hussein's defiance of world opinion. The Prime Minister spoke to the House of Commons and the nation. Earlier this evening, the Cabinet met and gave the Chief of the Defence Staff, General de Chastelin, authority for the Canadian forces to carry out sweep and escort missions over Kuwait and Iraq, if necessary and appropriate. All Canadian forces in the Gulf will nevertheless remain under Canadian command. I profoundly regret, as I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, all members of this House do, that it has come to this. It is with no satisfaction that we take up arms, because war is always a tragedy. But the greater tragedy would have been for criminal aggression to go unchecked. 
My heart is filled with a deep sense of foreboding. Like every Canadian, like the mothers and fathers of those men and women representing us in the Persian Gulf, I am worried. I had hope that it will not come to this. Craig Oliver, our Ottawa Bureau Chief, is with me from Parliament Hill. And Craig, perhaps we better state here, since uh, it didn't appear in any of those reports we've heard, and for those tuning in late, that there has been a change in the orders of engagement for Canadian troops. The rules of engagement, Lloyd. Before we do that, may I just tell you that Canada was actively involved in this attack tonight. Uh, a Canadian tanker was refueling U.S. fighters in the air. Uh, they were between sorties, and this was just outside the airspace uh, of Iraq and Kuwait. So they did not violate their rules of engagement. Uh, the war began for Canadians with a phone call from George Bush to Brian Mulroney at his home, 24 Sussex. I think that call came around 6 o'clock, but the White House has asked world leaders not to reveal when they got the phone calls for protocol reasons. Mulroney phoned his key advisors. He summoned his war cabinet. That included de Chasteltain and the leading uh, military and defense experts. He told de Chasteltain to put the word out immediately, which only took about a minute, and Canada has its own instant communication with its uh, pilots and its forces in the Gulf, telling them that they had new rules of engagement. They could enter enemy airspace and take the battle to them uh, if they uh, wished and if the U.S. air commanders or the U.N. commanders involved told them to do so. Then Mulroney went down to the House of Commons and made the argument he's been making all week that Canada is only acting in concert with the United Nations, that the United Nations has given Iraq every possible opportunity to find a way besides war out of this uh, crisis and that Iraq refused to do so and therefore force was the only way, that there was simply no choice but the use of force at this point. Then right. it came the turn of the opposition leaders. They both said they will back the Canadian government, back the Canadian forces. An embarrassing evening for Jean Chrétien, who had taken advice that he should say Canadian forces should pull out. He is not saying that any longer. Yes, Craig, uh, just a quick comment from you. There has been a coalition of uh, unity then, of opinion and support around the Canadian forces fighting in the Gulf from all parties tonight. This will be, for the moment at least, and perhaps not for long, a nonpartisan foreign policy effort, a, a war effort, and we'll see just how long that lasts as the opposition in the country begins to build. Thank you, Craig. Good night. We've heard some of what the things sounded like tonight in Baghdad, and we've received reaction from Washington and Ottawa. We want to go now to our reporters on the scene in the Gulf and in Israel. We have Martin Himmel standing by in Jerusalem, George Wolfe in Saudi Arabia, Jim O'Connell in Bahrain, and CTV's Jim Munson in Qatar. Uh, we go first to Israel. Sorry, we're going to Jim O'Connell first of all. Uh, Jim, uh, you're in Bahrain. Uh, what's the response there to this uh, first sortie by American forces? Well, people are still waking up, and uh, uh, many have yet to react to the news, but there are many conflicting reports here in Bahrain as we speak. Civil defense authorities here are reporting now that at one point, Iraqi Scud missiles had been launched in the direction of this island, Bahrain, but that they had fallen short of their target. Now, that set off a bit of a panic about 4 o'clock in the morning here. The air raid sirens sounded. Hotel staff knocked on our doors. They told us to close our windows and to shut off the air conditioning in case there was a chemical attack. And shortly after that, the all-clear sounded, and officials declared that the danger had passed. But I should stress we have no official confirmation that Iraqi missiles were aimed at this island. Thank you very much, Jim. Now, uh, Jim Munson, who is standing by in Qatar. Jim, the response uh, down there. All right, I'm in a hotel just at the edge of the airport runway in Qatar, and it's daylight now. But uh, just before dawn, uh, four CF-18s took off for their mission over the Gulf. And there are now six CF-18s in the air and 18 on the tarmac. We have no confirmation here whether they have been involved in any sort of combat. At the base itself, there were two alerts in the middle of the night. Uh, the armed forces personnel quickly put on their chemical suits and gas masks, but there were no attacks here. Thank you, Jim. A short while ago, I spoke to CTV's George Wolfe uh, in Bahrain, and uh, he said that despite reports that uh, Iraq had fired Scud missiles at Saudi Arabia, uh, they missed their mark, and uh, from all reports, there was no damage. Here is part of that conversation. 
Uh, the alert is definitely down here. The, uh, the Bahraini authorities are telling the citizens repeatedly that uh, they can stand down. And the scene I'm seeing here on the uh, Saudi Arabian side of the Gulf is similar, that there's no panic in the streets. People, those who are still in the city, are standing in the streets talking, many of them without gas masks. George, there's a general impression over here coming solely from the side of the American sources we have been listening to that uh, this initial raid on Baghdad and uh, Iraq has been uh, successful and uh, gone ahead as planned. Is uh, that the sort of word you're getting over there? Well, this, uh, as you can see, Lloyd, is uh, the time of sunup in Saudi Arabia, and this is the time which is going to tell the tale. The uh, Iraqi forces are reputed to be poor night fighters, and the question now is how many of them survived the night attack how many of them will go up into the air and try to take on the, uh, the American attackers? That's something we'll see as the day goes on here. Uh, we understand that, that they are now returning to base uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so we should have some indication fairly soon of uh, the rest of the information, that is the casualties, uh, how successful the operation. But uh, for what it's worth, Dick Cheney is saying that uh, they encountered very little resistance, which uh, some people find rather hard to believe. I think one of the uh, factors in uh, the resistance being so low was mentioned uh, by Les Aspen in a broadcast I monitored from Washington. He's the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. In the course of preparing for war with the Soviet Union, the Americans developed a very, very sophisticated electronic jamming capability. And they've turned that capability through uh, an aircraft I mentioned before in a telephone conversation, the F-4 Wild Weasel. They've turned that jamming capability against Saddam Hussein's much more primitive communications network. And the, the feeling is that, uh, that Saddam runs a very, very centralized command system. And if they've been able to put Saddam in a position where he can't pick up a telephone and tell his people what to do, then chaos may very well be reigning in his armed forces. George Wolf recorded earlier. Now, Martin Himmel is on the line to us from Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been the focus of a great deal of attention tonight because of the threat from Saddam Hussein that it would be the first hit for, from him uh, should there be an attack from multinational forces. Well, what's been going on there tonight, Martin? Hello? Hello, Martin. Yes, I'm just here. What's, been, what's been going on there tonight? You're on the air. Uh, Lloyd, basically what we have here is uh, daylight is coming up. And, um, and people are staying in their homes, they're not allowed to leave. You have to open up your gas mask, put them out on the side, but not put them on. They're very relieved to hear that the Iraqi missile sites have virtually been destroyed, but no one's taking any chances yet because some of those missile sites are uh, mo mobile. In addition to that, uh, there is a massive curfew in the West Bank and Gaza. No one is allowed out there. In the, basically, Israelis are trying to prevent them from uh, the Palestinians from taking any action to that while this war is going on. So everybody's inside, everybody's with their gas masks, and there's been a limited call-up of the key defense personnel as well. Martin, from what you know, have the Israelis participated in any way in the activities of the evening? Question. Hello, Martin. Have the Israelis participated... Now I can hear you. Can you repeat the question again? Repeat yes, it twice yes, I can. Yes, yes, I can. Can you tell me whether the Israelis have participated in any way that you know of in tonight's activities? Hello? Hello. I think, yes. we'll, I think we'll have to pack this one in, uh, Martin. We're having some communications problems, and goodness knows well, I might like tonight that's understanding. Thank you. We'll forego it for now. Uh, the Allies in the Gulf have assembled one of the most powerful Air Force armadas in history, and as it swung into action tonight, some of the most sophisticated, sophisticated military equipment in the world was used in battle for the very first time. That equipment not only made a nighttime attack possible, it made it almost inevitable. As Dennis Trout explains, the new equipment is used both in the air and on the ground. On a clear day, anyone can see forever in the desert, but on a clear night... Oh, we own the night. We own the night. On a clear night, special nighttime vision equipment means that U.S. forces can see forever then too, or almost forever. U.S. forces are expected to have an enormous advantage in combat with Iraq. That's because new technology allows Americans to do much of the fighting at night when they can see, and presumably, the Iraqis cannot. We consider the night warfare capabilities, both in the air and on the ground, of our forces to be a tremendous advantage militarily. 
One system used in the Gulf is called Lantern. Seen here in tests in Arizona, Lantern uses a combination of infrared and radar technology that turns night into day. The result is plain to see. Pilots can fly extremely close to the ground without crashing, then find and destroy enemy targets with startling accuracy. It is the most advanced, the best in the tactical fighter business uh, that, uh, that I've ever experienced. American commanders are eager for much of the fighting to happen at night, when U.S. aircraft would be far less vulnerable to handheld Iraqi missiles. When the U.S. bombed Libya in 1986 in response to terrorist attacks, the raid came at night. So did the invasion of Panama in 1989, when night-flying helicopters attacked military facilities and transported special operations forces. U.S. helicopters can fly at night when pilots wear special night vision goggles, which take existing light, such as from the moon or stars, and amplify it several thousand times. But using all this high-tech equipment can be something of a high-wire act. Experts caution that what looks so promising in training often can fail in a real war. Dennis Trout, ABC News, the Pentagon. There have been anti-war demonstrations all across Canada and the United States over the past few days, and Canada's peace movement was mobilizing tonight as well. The Toronto Disarmament Network is promising major demonstrations across the country tomorrow. No blood for oil! No blood for oil! No and tonight, even as the bombing in Baghdad was getting started, about 30 people were demonstrating outside the American consulate in Toronto. The number of protesters swelled to about 300 just a few hours later. They blocked off a major downtown street. Reports say the protest is peaceful, but mounted police units are on the scene to contain the crowd. And there was a vigil tonight on uh, Parliament Hill in Ottawa. We're going to have a brief look at that. A silent vigil for peace on Parliament Hill tonight as the peace tower clock rings and the bombs rained down on Baghdad. Pamela Wallen is in our Situation Room tonight with her guests. Pamela, perhaps now we can uh, sum up again the course of events over the last several hours. Yes, Lloyd, Canada is at war, and as we have learned just a few moments ago, we have been actively participating in that war since early this evening. Eastern Time. Colonel Brian McDonald is here, one and also a Breeder General uh, Bud Taggart is with us. Uh, Colonel McDonald, could you start, please, and situate what uh, the Canadian forces and where they have moved in the course of the evening? Well, it's become clear that the Canadian fighter aircraft have been continuing their combat air patrols in the area of the northern part of the Gulf, but we've just learned that the Boeing 707 tanker aircraft has been deployed up there and participated in this night's operations by refueling the F-15 fighter bombers that were taking part in the operation. Uh, Brigadier General Taggart, at this point we have heard reports out of the Pentagon that they, uh, their position is that they have decimated the Iraqi troops. Uh, the, uh, they have been bombing through Iraq tonight. Can you give us your assessment of that? Uh, certainly, uh, from the initial information, it looks like they've achieved a considerable victory, but uh, not a total victory. I expect it will continue for at least another two to three days. And I would also suggest that it has not yet been a triumph of technology. It'll be about 24 hours before the satellite reconnaissance will permit us to assess the damage and to see, in fact, if it has been destroyed. But it looks like the Air Force retaliatory capability has been negated by the attack. Colonel McDonald, where are we now? Have we seen the first wave? Are we in a pause of activity? What is the strategy as far as we can uh, determine it coming out of uh, the Pentagon and the multinational? Well, it's forces? clear that we've won, if you will, the black box war. The mm -hmm. electronics on the coalition side are clearly vastly superior to that on the Iraqi side. This first strike which went in against the ballistic missile targets such as those in western Iraq threatening the state of Israel mm -hmm. have been completely successful. A few of the ballistic missiles appear to have been fired in the general direction of Bahrain. The attack on the command and control centers and the attack on the airfields appears to, at this point to have been very successful indeed. All right, Brigadier General uh, Taggart, on that question of the Scud missiles, uh, and people are surprised that Iraq was unable to mount any of them tonight to make any strike at all that we can really uh, determine at this point, but those 
Scud missile bases are mobile. Might they have been moved to safety at this point? Yeah, I, I find it hard to believe that all of the Scud missiles have been destroyed. Certainly the fixed installations have probably gone. There were signals this morning that they were starting to uh, prepare and fuel the missiles for launch and also signs that they were preparing chemical warheads to be fitted to the missiles and that may well have uh, made the decision very much easier for President Bush. But uh, it will take uh, 12 to maybe 36 hours before the Iraqi Defense Forces can regroup and launch any kind of attack. And the daylight hours will be essential to them because they do not have the night capability that the Americans have. All right, you're saying 12 to 36 <coughs> hours, but we're seeing daylight in Iraq and Baghdad right now. Could we possibly see in the next few hours some kind of massive Iraqi response? Well, it depends on how many of the Iraqi airplanes, in fact, are still in existence after last night's uh, engagement. If we then have a substantial amount of the Iraqi Air Force, they could launch a counterattack. They could, in fact, defend more aggressively if the coalition continues to attack during the daylight hours. So what's the next plan? What do we do now? What are we waiting to see? What would be a signal to us that we're into another phase or into a continuation of the, uh, of the airstrike phase? I think that we would see a continuation of the bombing attacks on the air bases in order to completely eliminate the Iraqi Air Force from the equation. And that certainly appears to be now well within the capability of the coalition quite quickly. And we should see the air part of the battle wound up within two or three days, I would think. Brigadier General, this is going to continue through the night. Yes, I think the, uh, the signal, too, is that the air battle has been won. It will be the use and employment of the B-52s, carpet bombing, and uh, trying to dislodge the uh, Iraqi forces, particularly the ones that are located in the V towards Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. But certainly all the fortifications will come under attack. The real horror of the war will begin with the use of carpet bombing, aerosol explosive, cluster bombs, and the casualty rates. And they'll have to do that to dislodge them from their berms and their fixed uh, fortifications. All right, I want to put that question to both of you, you at this point. We've, we've talked about a quick war and, and uh, the American hopes at this point for a bloodless war. But is it going to be? Is this going to not, in fact, be a high casualty engagement? Well, of course, at this point, we come back to that fine old traditional term called the fog of war. We've seen a successful first operation. Mm -hmm. We are at this in, in a sense in our euphoria, or certainly the American uh, forces yes. in the euphoria, assuming that everything else is going to go perfectly. I think that we have to wait and see. It could very well develop into a grinding uh, sort of uh, operation with very high casualty rates, certainly amongst the Iraqi side. Yes, uh, Pamela, I would suggest this is not the time for euphoria and optimism. It's the time for prudence mm -hmm. and a great deal of caution on the part of the coalition forces. But you think that this, too, is going to be a high casualty war? It, it will if there is not an immediate surrender by the Iraqi forces. And I, I'm concerned at who is in control to surrender the forces in the country. Uh, certainly, uh, they have indicated this is a holy war. Well, the nice uh, feed out front. Eva, who decided who sent the grandest jackpot in the history of New York State? Get ready. This could be your year. Well, of course, in large part, this all came down to the whole Sabres met Detroit. The Red Wings embarrassed them 8-3. to three. Tonight, the Sabres continue to show the NHL. <laughs> then they saw earlier in the... It's conceivable to... ...the trailing Detroit one numbers. The entire Iraqi Air Force could be decimated, wiped out? Robin, I don't think so. I, I, that'd be a phenomenal thing if it happened. I believe part of the Iraqi Air Force was stowed away up in the northern part of the country. And uh, we're near, near the Turkish, uh, near the Turkish border. That's correct. The real question is going to be: Did uh, some of our uh, F-111Bs leave Turkey on a combat mission and cross the border and and take on some of the uh, Iraqi Air Force up here in the northern part of the country? They've got some uh, Badgers that have some uh, supersonic kind of uh, uh, missiles on them that can home in on ships. Uh, they have about 15 or 18 of those. It's a Chinese version. It's going to be interesting to see if they end up trying to launch those on radar targets on ships or some of the cities uh, down in, like Riyadh down in Saudi Arabia. So uh, they won't know, I don't believe, until tomorrow morning for sure where the uh, Iraqi Air Force is at and whether we really got it all. General Donnelly, are the night fighting uh, capacities of the, uh, of the uh, U.S. Air Force and the uh, Navy attack planes so uh, extraordinary that uh, the Pentagon could be confident at this stage that the Air Force, uh, Iraqi Air Force, was decimated? 
I, I'm like Dan. I, I'd have to question uh, that we got the whole Air Force because uh, if they had a lot of their airplanes in their hardened aircraft shelters, which we know they have, then they'd be very difficult to, to dig out at that point. Uh, I would have to say that we probably were able to defeat many of their defenses as we went in, and that's also part of their air picture. Uh, Bill Sweetman is a technology expert. How does that kind of feat of uh, arms, uh, advanced arms, strike you in the space of a few hours to claim that you have wiped out? I mean, there are 700 planes, are there not, in the Iraqi Air Force? Yes, it would be extraordinary if they had indeed managed to uh, decimate decimate the Air Force um, in that short of a space of time. Uh, the only thing that I would suggest we've never seen in action before um, that might make that credible uh, is, the is, is the ability of a modern Air Force to be guided um, to operate according to very up-to-date satellite intelligence. Um, that's something that we have never seen in action before. Um, uh, that could have made the difference. Gen General Wickham, you've been uh, in our previous programs and conversations very confident about the, uh, the capacities of, uh, of these modern um, uh, airborne forces. Uh, what is your comment on the, on the reports out of the Pentagon that the Iraqi Air Force has been decimated already? Robin, there's an old phrase in the military, uh, beware the first reports from the battlefield. And I think we've got to be very cautious that we don't read too much into these reports. We have to wait for pilots to come back, look at the film that they brought, get their own briefs of what they did uh, for satellites to take a look at bomb damage, as uh, Colin Powell said, to give us a good bomb damage assessment before we can really make a solid calculation. I would be very cautious about saying we had decimated uh, the Air Force. And I think also the other point, to Robin, about destroying the uh, Republican guards. They are scattered in several locations, and uh, they are used as a strategic reserve. Uh, we probably have brought damage to them. They are the, the elite of the elite in terms of Iraqi forces. Uh, the, the, um, the encouraging thing, however, to me here as a, as a soldier is that the president's point that uh, we are going to prevail as quickly as possible and that the authority has been given to the commanders to do that, to uh, make use of all forces uh, to fulfill the goals there. And so we're going to see, I'm, I'm sure, a continuing rollout of capabilities. And as the BDA bomb damage assessment material begins to be made available to the media, then we're going to see some solid results. Okay. Dan McKinnon. It's been said all along that whatever capacity the Iraqi Air Force had was a daylight capacity compared to the um, nighttime capacity of the uh, U.S. and uh, other Western forces. It's going to be daylight any minute now, if it isn't already over there. What difference is daylight going to make to this battle so far? Well, my, I would imagine uh, the Navy is also getting into this. They had longer ways to travel. There are going to be a lot of A-6s and uh, attack aircraft following on. Uh, as we look back on the wars of Vietnam and the wars of Korea, we found there's been four basic mistakes in the use of air power. Uh, wrong timing was one of them. Uh, we never followed up on the attack. You make the initial attack and you don't follow up. Uh, you pick targets that weren't worth the effort and also poor training. Well, training is superb that we have. The targets certainly are worthwhile. The timing was right. The only question now is whether we've learned all our lessons from the past on failures of air power to do it right, are we going to follow up? And I think we're going to be following up all day tomorrow and for the next few days until we're absolutely sure we have just totally destroyed uh, their war-making capability. Um, the president um, uh, said in the uh, in outlining... And Israel has also confirmed the fact that it was told beforehand that uh, it would uh, about the exact... I have my whole family there, my grandparents and my cousins, and they're in the army there, so it really hits home. Just a few miles away from the Promenade shopping mall at the Jewish Community Center, the mood was even more somber. Members were in a meeting when the war broke out, and even though security has heightened here over the past few days, news of Operation Desert Storm still came as a shock. Everybody just took a deep breath and said, oh my God, war is something that that we read about and think about, and, and nobody's ever prepared. Many of our members have families in Israel. We just pray for them. We pray that everything's all right there.
This is Beverly Thompson reporting from Downsview. About 50 members of the Jewish community gathered at a Downsview synagogue tonight as the news of the attack unfolded. As more details became available, people at the synagogue became increasingly worried that Israel would become the next target. The meeting was organized by B'nai B'rith and had been scheduled for over a month, but those invited didn't know they would be meeting on the night war broke out. Some of the worry and emotion felt in this room tonight was eased when they heard from the Consul General to Israel, and he told them that the family and friends in Israel were well prepared for an attack. I have friends and family over there, and uh, but Israel is prepared. I think they're prepared militarily and psychologically. The way the uh, Consul General was speaking, I think they don't have nothing to, fear, to fear. The very real possibility of Israel becoming a target within the next few hours never left the minds of those gathered here at the meeting tonight. But even with that concern, they voiced support of Operation Desert Storm and anything else it takes to stop Saddam Hussein. Beverly Thompson, CFTO News. And, of course, there will be great relief in many Jewish homes in the metro area tonight at word that the U.S. and Allied air attacks have apparently wiped out the missile threat to Israel. A short time ago, Israel radio and television broadcast word of this to a country which is just waking up. There is, we're told, great relief in Israel tonight. Over 100 protesters gathered outside the U.S. consulate this evening in downtown Toronto, blocking University Avenue. Demonstrators gathered again outside the U.S. consulate, braving the drizzle and the cold as they chanted, Troops out, Mulroney out. Members of the crowd have been chanting anti-American slogans and singing, Give Peace a Chance. They argue that economic sanctions against Iraq have not been given enough time. Protesters stood outside the consulate before moving onto the street, holding candles in their hands and continuing to chant against the current situation. A Toronto ham radio operator says he is picking up the sounds of the U.S. Air Forces flying over Iraq. Craig Evans says he is listening to history in the making. CFTO's Austin Delaney has more. Seconds later. Faintly in the background, you can hear a pilot respond. He has six hours of fuel left. Craig Evans says he has been listening to the forces in the Middle East since they were sent over, but says tonight is a ham radio operator's dream, history in the making. Well, they're giving new function codes where they can realign themselves. Like, they've already made one assault, now they got it back and realign themselves up. So with that, the code functions change because they can't keep using the same codes because someone's going to realize what codes they are. In the short time we were listening, we heard Mother Base tell pilots to head for Athens and Cairo if they were running out of fuel. Austin Delaney, CFTO News. Tom Clark is now standing by live from Bahrain at the Canadian Forces Base, where, like everything else, things have changed dramatically in the last few hours. Iraqi missiles, we were told tonight, Tom, were fired at Bahrain but fell short. Well, we understand the same thing, uh, Chris. What happened was that at about 4 a.m. Bahraini time, which was about an hour and a half after the attack on Baghdad began, the air raid sirens here in Bahrain went off. This followed uh, uh, by minutes an order from the hotel in which I'm staying to black out. Uh, we didn't know at the time what it was all about, but about uh, half an hour after the first air raid sirens, uh, the all clear was sounded. Meanwhile, the Bahraini Civil Defense Authority has reported that five Scud missiles were launched against Bahrain and targets in eastern Saudi Arabia. Uh, but apparently they all fell short. There was no further explanation as to why they fell short. Uh, one assumes, though, it is because that Bahrain is on the furthest edge, really, of the Scud missile range. Tom, I don't know whether you are aware tonight or not of the uh, political changes that have been going on here in Canada and the changes that are now affecting the Canadian Armed Forces there. Have you been told that they are now uh, in a position where they are allowed to go on the attack? Uh, no, uh, Ken, uh, as often happens in this business, uh, we've just switched roles, and you're telling me something I didn't know. 
Uh, I have been in contact uh, with the uh, command at uh, Canadian Forces Headquarters here in Bahrain, but they have uh, been telling uh, all of us reporters uh, absolutely nothing. They have said that they will wait until the cabinet meeting is finished before they announce anything, uh, so I suppose I now have to jump on them. Is anything happening there right now, Tom? Chris, it is now daybreak in Bahrain. The security uh, at uh, the hotel that I'm at, which is in the central part of the city, uh, is now e extreme. Nobody is being allowed into this hotel who is not a guest. All luggage is being searched, and people are being kept away uh, by a perimeter fence. What the authorities here, three and a half miles from where we are, and uh, at about uh, 2 a.m. Bahrain time, which would have been 6 p.m. in Toronto, uh, we were uh, uh, rattled, literally rattled, by the roar of B-52 engines uh, as they lifted off uh, from uh, Bahrain, followed by uh, a number of waves of what I assumed were uh, British RAF uh, fighter jets uh, heading up the shore. It's about a half hour's flying time from here to Iraq, and uh, half an hour later, uh, of course, the uh, battle for Baghdad began. Tom, we're going to have to uh, leave you now and return to events uh, happening here at home. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Uh, Baton Broadcasting National Editor Tom Clark speaking to us live from Bahrain. Chris? Premier Bob Ray has condemned the U.S.-led attack on Iraq. Ray says he's deeply saddened by the decision to go to war, and the Premier says, in his view, sanctions should have been given more time to force Saddam to leave Kuwait. Here is CFTO's Queen's Park reporter, Tim Sheehy. Ray was at the King Edward Hotel in downtown Toronto tonight to speak to the Investment Dealers Association, and he emerged to condemn the American actions tonight in Iraq. I guess I always put it in very personal terms. Is this a cause for which I myself would uh, would uh, go to the desert and fight for it. And the answer, quite bluntly, is no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want my children to go. I wouldn't want anybody's children to go. I would want people to go to stop, to act in, 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 in a co coherent and, 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 and united way to stop further aggression and to, to obviously to make sure that sanctions were able to have an effect. I think all those things were fine. Ray also had strong words for the federal government, criticizing Canada's participation in the Gulf. The Premier says it is still too early to talk about the initiation of emergency measures like petroleum rationing in Ontario, but he says the government is keeping an eye on both petroleum prices and supply. As well, he says three hospitals, including Toronto's Sunnybrook, have been prepared to accept Canadian casualties should that become necessary. And the Premier would not discuss what security arrangements had been made, saying he was concerned about that information falling into the wrong hands. Ray says that he still has not decided yet if he'll call the Prime Minister, but there is no doubt what the Premier would tell Mulroney if he does speak to him. Ray says that even at this late stage, he still has some very serious reservations about the justification for Canada's military involvement in the Gulf. Tim Sheehy, CFTO News. And for reaction from metro area MPs to the events in the Persian Gulf this evening, we go now to CFTO's Bill Rogers in Ottawa. Many MPs watched the early moments of the war unfold on TV sets in their Parliament Hill offices. Their reactions ranged from shock and dismay to a quiet confidence the war would be over soon. I think that it had to happen. Uh, we had to uh, have the... Apparently, the Scud missiles in western Iraq, which they were very concerned about striking Israel, seem to have been knocked out at this point. That seems to be the case. There was concern here that there might be some Scuds that would be launched toward us. Remember, the Scuds are those Soviet-made missiles which have been modified by the Iraqis so that they have a 500-plus mile range and could strike here at this air base some several hundred miles away from Iraq. There was concern that they had lifted off. That turns out to have been a false report. This was what was called the suppression of enemy air defense tactics. They were trying to knock out the eyes and ears of Saddam Hussein, the command and control center. They were trying to make sure that he wouldn't know what was going on in the rest of the country. They were testing the radar, jamming it, knocking it out. And so far, Ted, as you heard Peter say, we don't know of any casualties. It appears to have been a spectacular run for uh, the Allied forces. Has there, in fact, uh, been any word of Iraqi planes that have taken off to engage U.S. aircraft? 
I haven't heard a single thing about it, which is actually stunning. It appears that the Iraqis either have chosen not to challenge the Allied force in the air because they've got those Mirage F-1 fighters. They do have just a very few MiG-29s, which people say are comparable to our F-15. That's our, our best fighter. That would have been a challenge up there, the Iraqi pilots versus the ability of the American pilots. But they seem not to have done that. And there are at least some people who feel that a lot of that Air Force may have been knocked out on the ground. Certainly, the Iraqis were surprised. There is also some suggestion, Forrest, that the Iraqis may have taken those planes and put them in underground bunkers so that they can live to fight another day. Well, there is that, that question. What is Saddam doing? Why has he laid back so much? Well, it could be that he is simply trying to take the Americans' best shot, that he's going to hold his forces as best he can, and then down the road, as you say, attempt to take them on in ground combat. Whether that happens or not, we're going to have to see as these days of airstrikes go on. By the way, Ted, there's going to be some, I suspect, spectacular footage that will likely be released very soon. From the F-15s, there are cameras placed in the nose as they're moving in on the strike. They've been taking video. We believe that that might actually be released very soon. We're going to be watching for it. We're also going to be watching for some uh, pool footage. By that, I mean the uh, camera crews that were out there uh, and will all come back to us. We'll have a look at that video. If it comes back in an hour or so, we'd like to have a look at that. It'll be the planes coming back from their missions, and it should be in daylight hours as well. We're, we're looking for that, bit, Ted, and, and we'll see what we come to. All right, Forrest, stand by if you would. We're going to come back to you in a few minutes. Uh, but for the moment, we want to go to our White House correspondent, Britt Hume, who is standing by, and our Pentagon correspondent, Bob Zelnick. Britt, first you. Uh, anything new from the White House? When did the president go to bed, or is he, uh, is he staying up tonight? Uh, or do we even know? Well, he's been in the family quarters for some time now, Ted, and. Uh, with his overnight guest, uh, Dr. Billy Graham, his friend and, uh, we're told, longtime spiritual advisor. Uh, how late the president uh, was going to stay up tonight is, was a question. He went to bed early last night, as you know, uh, but we don't know for sure whether he's gone to sleep now or not. He was continuing to receive updated reports uh, uh, from General Scowcroft and others here at the White House. The last announcement that came from here, which uh, I've not had a chance to report to you, is that uh, the president signed an order today to open up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and sales of oil from that will begin tomorrow. Uh, this is in concert with other uh, countries participating in the International Energy Agency, and the whole idea is a psychological move to try to offset uh, uh, a surge in oil prices caused by this uh, conflict. There are, curiously enough, uh, I was hearing again, and I've been getting the information the way that most Americans have been getting it, and that is a snippet from radio here, a snippet from television there, but apparently the Asian stock markets have opened, and uh, whereas initially uh, the uh, uh, Tokyo stock market plunged, apparently it has recovered and has even gained, and the same is true in Hong Kong and I believe in a couple of other Asian markets. Uh, but uh, do we know yet what's happening with oil prices? Uh, I don't have any word on that, uh, Ted, and obviously this uh, whole question of energy policy and whether this is a war for oil is one that's going to be argued for some time. Uh, the president's move in opening the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is obviously an effort to counter uh, some tremendous surge uh, caused by uh, the psychology of the situation. Of course, it isn't going to, to necessarily do that if there's some major disruption of actual oil supplies. Of course, that hasn't happened in this conflict at all, as, uh, or in this whole crisis, as you know, but it's still, uh, there has been a boost in oil prices. Uh, John McCarthy is standing by at the State Department, but before we leave Britt Hume, I, I just want to know, it, it, this may seem like a strange thing to ask, Britt, but I would have a, a sense that the President is probably enormously relieved after five and a half months of, of wondering whether, if, when, at least the decision has now been taken. Any, 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 any suggestion of how, his, how he's been reacting this evening? Uh, Ted, I think that's a good question, in fact, and, and I think that the decision while they put out a lot of uh, explanation today about how the process worked, uh, the purpose of which was to make it uh, appear at least that technically the decision to, to go was made today. In fact, it was abundantly clear from the way this whole operation was carried out and from other things that we know that the decision in principle to do this, and indeed the selection of the date was carried out uh, days ago, if not even longer. And the president, uh, while he was very tense up to and through the period of the Baker Aziz meeting last week, seems like last month, uh, has been more relaxed and seemingly increasingly so in recent days. 
And the sense I have is, and indeed um, someone who spoke to him uh, uh, in recent days on a private phone conversation said that the president seemed to, to snap out of that and relax once the decision to go had been made and it was clear that there was not going to be any reprieve from Saddam Hussein changing his mind at the last minute. So, yes, there's a very clear sense that the president is relieved that this decision at least is behind him. All right, Bert, thank you. Now, John McCarthy is standing by at the State Department. John, I'm going to throw it to you the only way I know how at this point. What's new? What have you learned? Well, first of all, uh, as a sign of uh, how at ease certain members of the administration are, Ted, uh, Secretary Baker has left the State Department uh, and has gone home and gone to bed, uh, from all that we can tell. Uh, the Secretary began his day by calling in the Saudi ambassador first thing uh, and telling the Saudis that the United States was going to go tonight uh, and wanted to make sure that the Saudis were completely on board, and of course they were. They told Secretary Baker they would be when he was out in the region last week. Um, throughout the afternoon, Secretary Baker began notifying other countries in the coalition uh, to a country, of course, they are all with the United States at this point. Uh, it remains to be seen what's going to actually happen when a ground war is opened up uh, on this particular front. Secretary Baker was upstairs in the State Department watching ABC News, oddly enough, when uh, Gary Shepard reported from the scene uh, that the war had, in fact, started. Um, now the Secretary uh, is going to carry through tomorrow morning. The first thing he does, he'll be over at the White House uh, with uh, Brent Scowcroft, the President's National Security Advisor, and Secretary of Defense Cheney. The three of them will have breakfast, uh, and then they'll all go and talk to the President. So, John, I, I don't want to blindside you, but I heard a, a, a rumor as I was coming in, a report that the uh, Turkish Parliament may be convening within a matter of hours, and that they are intending a declaration of war against Iraq. Do you know anything about that? Um, I have uh, also heard that, Ted, and in fact, it does not come as a great surprise. Uh, when uh, I was in Turkey with Secretary Baker just a couple of days ago, uh, there were all sorts of rumors uh, circulating around Ankara about what the role of the Turks would be in all of this. Um, they were very careful to say in public at that point that there would be no offensive operations from Turkish air bases, uh, but privately American officials said they anticipated that American aircraft would be flying bombing missions from that country at some point during the war. It appears that uh, Turgat Ozal, the president of Turkey, uh, is now trying to position his country to do just that. Now, that's where the F-111 fighter bombers are based, well, right? There are some F-111s there. There are various other aircraft, but it's the F-111s in particular that they would like to fly there. There are lots of F-111s in Saudi Arabia, not just in Turkey. All right, John McCarthy, thank you very much. And now to the Pentagon and Bob Zelnick. Uh, Bob, what is, the, what is the latest news? And I suppose we should pick up with the issue that is of most concern to most Americans right now. Uh, and that is the, the welfare of those pilots who engaged in those missions earlier on tonight. On that subject, Ted, uh, the news is good but not precise. Everyone that we've talked to, including senior military officials within the past half hour, say the uh, results appear to be very, very good, but uh, because the information is not complete, uh, they are not giving precise figures on the number of planes, if any, that were lost or the number of human casualties on the American side. On the other hand, we are getting uh, a good deal of information now about the uh, raid itself, the targets that were selected, and the results of the raids. Uh, let me go over some of the targets with you. Uh, one big category were the Scud missiles. Uh, the uh, senior figure with whom we spoke said that these are very small targets in terms of their size, and it won't really be until we've had a chance to uh, oversee this uh, area in daylight that we know precisely how many were hit and how many were destroyed. But uh, the initial results appear to be good for the simple reason that there's still, at this point, no instance of a confirmed Scud launching by the Iraqis. Bob, let me just interrupt you for one second so that you can also explain what is so terribly important about those Scud missiles. Those are the ones that presumably uh, could be used or would be used against Israel. And of course, the question of whether Israel is going to become involved uh, in combat here is a, a terribly delicate one in terms of diplomatic and political terms? No, no question about that, Ted. Uh, they were uh, uh, particularly the ones located in western Iraq. But I, I think it, it's also fair to say, and I don't want to sound cold-blooded uh, when I'm discussing this, but that the question of whether Israel was attacked and got into the war was more important from a political viewpoint before the United States and its Arab allies started fighting. Everything that I picked up in talking to uh, U.S. strategists, both military and civilian, the past couple of weeks indicated 
that the greatest political danger was if it started out as an Arab-Israeli war and the, uh, the support fell out of the Arab coalition uh, backing the United States. Now that uh, it, they have, in fact, joined the fighting, uh, it, it's less of a political danger, although, of course, no one would want to see uh, Israel get hit with scuds. Now, uh, there's a third category of targets and also a, a quite important one, and these are the uh, uh, air facilities and other permanent big structures uh, inside Iraq, chemical warfare and potential nuclear weapons facilities, biological facilities, and in the words of one very senior official here, we hit the big things pretty good. Uh, they used an awful lot of cruise missiles, a uh, hundred or more. They were armed with area cluster devices which tore up big stationary targets like tarmacs, buildings, etc. And they're very uh, confident that uh, not only the air airport facilities and chemical facilities, but also any aircraft which were not in hangars uh, are, are in a pretty bad state right now. Another category of targets, uh, and this is, uh, you'll appreciate, a very, very important one. These are the elite Republican Guard units. Now, there have been some extravagant claims made uh, this throughout the course of the evening over how we decimated the uh, Republican Guards. Let me say this. Uh, I am told uh, on good authority that we did employ B-52s uh, against the Republican Guards, even on this, the first night of the war. But in terms of uh, uh, damage assessment, we're really not going to get a handle on that until uh, we, we listen to some things and look at some things uh, in the daylight. And uh, the best information we have is that even if this were an unqualified success, these are big, tough, well-entrenched units, and it's far from decisive after the first uh, day of battle. Again, in the words of a senior official, this is an ongoing operation. We've stopped to refuel, basically, and debrief ourselves. We're going to send up some spy... Uh, aircraft and of course the spy satellites uh, in daylight and get a better handle on what we did. All right, Bob Zelnick, thank you very much. I have a number of other questions I'd like to pose to you, but we may come to you a little bit later on if you'd be good enough to stand by. We're going to take a short break. Hopefully they'll finish very quickly and Joe will be home fast. Tom Pettit, uh, tell us what's going on there and what's on uh, Vitaly's mind tonight. Well, the situation in Moscow is a bit unusual. The government has not said anything one way or the other about the U.S. military intervention with the U.N. forces in the Gulf, though the Soviet Union had supported that action. Yes, uh, from the early morning, I listen over the gymnastics music in my radio, but I have three phone calls from my friends about the start of the war. But people are troubled. His troops, how long would he be able uh, to, to hold out? And the reason I ask for that is that one of the things that George Bush will face, as well, is public opinion in his own country. Well, Saddam Hussein is not concerned about public opinion. We have seen that quite clearly. I must say to you, and sort of coming to the overview aspect of this, there are certain parts of uh, this story that are highly reminiscent of a man called Hitler. Uh, we heard the Hitler words about Saddam Hussein some months ago. The news is on. for any possible terrorist attack. All federal installations throughout our country are in a state of increased security tonight. And there are increased patrols at the base in the falls. I should also mention that the power plant nearby is in a state of higher security awareness tonight. Now, the 914th, uh, as we know, provides uh, support uh, in terms of uh, equipment, supplies, and even uh, military personnel uh, to our people uh, in the front lines, if necessary, and it's possible uh, in the days ahead that they may uh, be pressed into duty. Kevin? Rich, I know you feel particularly close to that unit. You were in Saudi Arabia with them. Thank you for that report tonight. Okay. Tonight's military operation is causing some storm of controversy as local police groups react to the bombing of Baghdad. Representatives of the Buffalo Coordinating Committee on the Middle East Crisis or didn't ap apply in Iran, Iraq, and, and their eight-year conflict. I think we have to recognize that uh, now, we're, we're, if the American reports are accurate, and if the optimistic view is, is, uh, is proves to be correct, that we have to talk about now what is the actual morale of the uh, troops on the ground in the Iraqi uh, entrenchments. Uh, what is the degree to which that artillery and those artillery and pieces and tanks that the president of the United States referred to are still in place, and to what extent the claims so far made are in fact uh, accurate? Those are the are the key questions. Will the Iraqis still hold on? Because now, logically, having gained control of the air, one would continue to actually attack the positions 
on the ground so that we don't have a very unpleasant uh, land war and that the Air Force can do uh, the mo most of the job. Nick Hook, you spend, of course, your days and nights thinking about what military aircraft can do. As you followed the events tonight, did anything surprise you? Um, not really. It was, to say it was a textbook operation would be an understatement. Um, if anything surprised me, it was perhaps the exocet factor which emerged in the Falklands. And by that I mean during the 1982 conflict in the South Atlantic, the exocet emerged as really the big surprise and took uh, everyone aback. And I, what I was expecting was maybe some unforeseen um, uh, sort of uh, terror weapon is too strong a word, but some, some weapon perhaps Fast deployed by the Iraqis which the, uh, the, the, uh, the Allied force had not counted on. But there, there appears absolutely no evidence of that whatsoever, uh, bearing in mind the fact that uh, all, the, all, all the coalition aircraft returned safely. Would you have expected that? Um, no, I, I certainly would not. I, I would have expected, uh, just by the very nature of all the aircraft that had gone out and all those sorties, um, some not to have returned. But uh, this is the amazing thing. They have, um, according to the reports, all returned safely. Professor Claypack, what do you think the U.S. and Allied military planners are looking at now? A slight pause, a resume, resumption of a bombardment, a resumption of the air war, or is the land war going to start quickly? Well, I think the, well, there's been a tendency to make a distinction between demonstration attacks and, uh, and significant attacks. Clausewitz always said, you know, that, diploma, uh, that war is simply a continuation of this, of, of uh, diplomacy, and that in fact one is continuing to demonstrate in each of these battles determination and uh, an intention to do something. I think if the reports are accurate, one will now be talking about airstrikes of significant, indeed very, very heavy intensity on troops that have never experienced that before in the Iraqi positions, and that in particular against, uh, against uh, armored positions and, uh, and artillery, but also uh, against the infantry. All right. Nick uh, Cook and Harold Claypack, thank you both very much. We return you now to Peter Mansbridge and The National. I'm Peter Mansbridge with continuing coverage of the Gulf crisis, Gulf War now. For five and a half months it was a crisis, tonight it is a war. Operation Desert Storm came like a flash of lightning with the thunder of bombs. It started less than 24 hours after Iraq ignored the UN deadline to withdraw from Kuwait. No one knows when it will end. Crisis became conflict shortly before 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. That's when waves of multinational F-15E fighter jets blasted down the runway and into the air from Saudi Arabia. Roughly 90 minutes later, bombs were falling on Iraqi targets. The first strike was massive, some say one of the biggest single air assaults in modern history. The Pentagon's also saying it was successful, claiming it decimated the Iraqi Air Force, much of the nation's elite Republican Guard, and several key Iraqi missile sites. There's no way of confirming that yet. But Iraq is certainly not about to give up. Not long ago, Saddam Hussein made a broadcast on Iraqi radio. The mother of all battles, he reportedly said, has begun. Everyone was expecting this, but the start of any war has to be unnerving, especially for people in Saudi Arabia. The BBC's Ben Brown reports now on how Operation Desert Storm unfolded there. Shortly after one o'clock in the morning, local time, the roar of American planes taking off from Riyadh Air Base. Four of them in the space of just a couple of minutes, then more at regular intervals afterwards. Among the aircraft taking off, AWACS spy planes, the eyes and ears of the Allied Air Force. The noise had already woken up most of the citizens of this city, and few of them had any doubt that this was the start of war. Those still asleep, however, were roused by the daunting sound of air raid sirens. Across Riyadh, people scurried for air raid shelters. Those who have chemical warfare protection suits quickly put them on and kept their gas masks close at hand. Exiled Kuwaitis here took a more relaxed attitude, sitting in this hotel lobby, listening to the radio for news, and expressing quiet satisfaction. 
Well, it's uh, very happy. Uh, I, I, I am Kuwaiti, and I'm waiting for this news long time. We're expecting that. We, we had confidence in the, all the uh, armies who were at the front. And thanks God they did it. And uh, I said he did a uh, big mistake, and uh, he's paying for it now. One five six three four Riyadh, uh, you had identified and continue bound here in the Alpha Major two two zero standby. And this is one of the American aircraft we've seen returning safely to base here. Many of the planes that took off from Riyadh, we understand, were tankers for air-to-air -air refueling. Their part in the mission as vital as that of the fighters and the bombers. Ben Brown, BBC News, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. The order for the air raids came from the United States, the dominant country in the multinational coalition. And in Washington tonight, the top three people in the U.S. chain of command, starting with George Bush, explained what the mission is all about. Well, obviously, we're having some audio problems with that. We'll get to back to it in a few moments' time. George Bush called Prime Minister Mulroney tonight, not long before the bombs began to fall. He told him what was about to happen, and not long after it, it did. There was an emergency session of Parliament in Ottawa. Look now at what the Prime Minister, Liberal leader Jean Chrétien, and NDP leader Audrey McLaughlin had to say. I profoundly regret, as I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, all members of this House do that it has come to this. It is with no satisfaction that we take up arms, because war is always a tragedy. But the greater tragedy would have been for criminal aggression to go unchecked. I am sure that the safety of the Canadian servicemen and women in the Gulf is uppermost in the minds of all members. Our hearts go out tonight to those families with loved ones, fathers or mothers, sons, and daughters and brothers and sisters on duty in the Persian Gulf. We are at war, Mr. Speaker, but all of us, we have to make sure that we are not losing the Canadian ambition, our historic quest for peace. We hope that this war will be short. We hope that all efforts will be made to find avenues to have ceasefires quickly, to make sure that there is not many men and women who will lose their lives in that process. I share the comments of the Prime Minister of the Leader of the Opposition that we support our troops that are there. Of course we do. Of course our hearts are with those troops. Of course we feel that they are in danger and that we we want to see the best for them. We want to them to return home. And we hope that the predictions that have been made about a long war will not be true. We'd be quite happy to be proven wrong in this event. Canada's three party leaders speaking in the House of Commons tonight. Now to those remarks from Washington, starting with George Bush. This past weekend, in a last ditch effort, the Secretary General of the United Nations went to the Middle East with peace in his heart, his second such mission. And he came back from Baghdad with no progress at all in getting Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait. Now, the 28 countries with forces in the Gulf area have exhausted all reasonable efforts to reach a peaceful resolution, have no choice but to drive Saddam from Kuwait by force. We will not fail. At the direction of the President, great care has been taken to focus on military targets, to minimize U.S. casualties, and to do everything possible to avoid injury to civilians in Iraq and Kuwait. The targets being struck tonight are located throughout Iraq and Kuwait. Our focus is on the destruction of Saddam Hussein's offensive military capabilities. We have not been uh, targeting Mr. Saddam Hussein. The purpose of our bombing facilities in the area of Baghdad is essentially to go after the command and control system of the Iraqi armed forces and we're looking at principally military targets, command and control installations, uh, air defense uh, sites that could uh, put our planes at risk but they are militarily oriented targets. 
Word of war spread quickly across this country tonight. There were somber thoughts about relatives in the Gulf, and there were noisy demonstrations. Eric Sorensen reports. In Montreal, anti-war protesters chanted no to war. In Vancouver, they rode bicycles and marched in the streets. And in Toronto, they braved a steady rainfall and blocked the street in front of the U.S. consulate. Many were furious with the United States. No, let for oil! I, the first thing I thought was, how dare they? How dare they do that? Who the hell do they think they are? Others were just as furious with Canada's involvement. And certainly Canada, um, as we've seen before, had uh, an opportunity to distance itself from this rush to, uh, to slaughter. And I'm just ashamed as a Canadian. I don't feel like a Canadian. Oh, no! Canadian troops! Oh, no! While many felt the need to demonstrate, in Cold Lake, Alberta, Dale Vogel was at home. Vogel's wife, Dolores, is in the Persian Gulf, ordering parts for CF-18s. Vogel watched the news on television with his three-year-old daughter. I hope it's going to be short and sweet, but I'm relieved it started. Relieved, but worried, too, until such time as the fighting stops and his wife returns home safely. Eric Sorensen, CBC News, Toronto. Joined again now by General Paul Manson, the former Chief of Defense Staff, Canadian Armed Forces. General, uh, we're hearing a lot from the multinational forces now, and specifically the Americans, some uh, pretty heady talk about it, them having wiped out the Iraqi Air Force on the ground tonight in the uh, first couple of waves going into Iraq. How likely is that? How realistic is that? Well, I uh, detect uh, the tone of acceleration on the part of those who took part in the uh, opening air campaign, and there can be no doubt that it was very successful by all accounts. I don't think we can accept some of the stories that are coming out to the effect that the Iraqi Air Force has been wiped out. I think that's a, a little bit of hyperbole, but uh, no doubt they have been very heavily hit, as have been some of the, the missiles that have caused so much concern. For example, the, uh, the Iraqi missile site located here in western Iraq, uh, undoubtedly pointing towards uh, Israel, has not been heard of, which suggests that it's been wiped out in the initial campaign. It's the other uh, missile sites uh, elsewhere in Iraq that uh, there have been stories all night that Scud missiles have been uh, uh, firing into uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia, no damage reported because of that. Let me get back to the Iraqi Air Force, though. Uh, if it wasn't destroyed on the ground, uh, how would it have been protected? The Iraqi Air Force has a number of airfields having hardened aircraft shelters. These are uh, steel reinforced concrete shelters uh, in which uh, airplanes can be put and protected pretty well from a conventional air attack. Uh, I have a feeling that the Iraqis, knowing that an attack was imminent, have put some of their better fighters, such as the uh, MiG-29, uh, in those waiting for uh, a response during daylight hours. Okay, well, we're into daylight hours now. If, in fact, that's what's happened, that they've been in these uh, heavy-duty concrete uh, bunkers, what w should we expect in the sense of what Iraqi planes are left if, in fact, there are any? I have a feeling that these aircraft are going to be launching within the next few hours, and their principal target is probably going to be these American carriers and battleships that are located uh, primarily here in the, uh, the Gulf itself, uh, whose aircraft will probably take part in the next major air attack on Iraq. So they'll want to go after those, and of course that has um, the, uh, the connotation of Canadian involvement because Canadians are flying protection over ships in the Gulf. That's right. The uh, primary role is protection over for ships in the Gulf, and now as we uh, find out tonight, the Canadian role expanded somewhat uh, to do the uh, sweep and escort role in, uh, over Kuwait and Iraq, which could, as we have said before, put them in, in this bomber escort role that some people feel is uh, offensive, some say defensive. Uh, yes, it, uh, it's an air defense mission, very much the same as the combat air patrol mission is, and there's an interesting philosophical debate as to whether it's getting into uh, offensive action. But I, personally, I have a feeling that uh, there's a reasonable argument to be made to the effect that if they're shooting down uh, an Iraqi aircraft that's trying to uh, attack uh, an American battleship that's about to launch cruise missiles, and not that much different from shooting down an Iraqi fighter that's about to attack an American bomber. All right, General, thanks very much. Now let's go to Saudi Arabia, where journal correspondent Brian Stewart is standing by. Brian, what can you tell us now there, a day breaking over Saudi Arabia and all sorts of different reports coming out about what, if any, action there has been response from, from Iraq? What can you tell us? 
Well, there's been a great number of rumors all night. There was a great drama whether Scud missiles had been fired in this direction. There were uh, air raid alarms. Guests in hotels were raced to the basements with respirators on. It seems the day is beginning with an enormous sigh of relief here. In fact, no attacks seem to have been launched. Uh, and, of course, the very large concern here is of the half million soldiers on the ground who, while they may discount about 20 or 30 percent of all claims by airmen as uh, traditionally exaggerated, are cheering on in a sort of go, go, go mood because they know that after the air war phase, they may still have to face that terrible slog through uh, Kuwait. And the more that the Iraqi our Air Force and the more that the Republican Guards are put down, the easier becomes that uh, terrible march. Yes, well, one of the reports uh, through this evening has been American claims that not only have they hit missile bases and air bases and, and uh, weapons factories, but they've also done severe damage, decimated, I think the word they're, they're using, the Iraqi Republican Guard, the elite uh, armed force of, of Iraq that has been sort of behind the front lines uh, digging in behind the front lines. Now, are you hearing that same kind of thing there? Indeed, those are the reports, though uh, there are many people here skeptical that an Air Force, however good, could decimate so large a force of 150,000 uh, elite troops in one night of bombing. But, however, it is uh, expected here that they will have taken a severe battering and indeed will face uh, renewed battering over the coming days. This is absolutely crucial to the land war in Kuwait. They are by far the best troops that those taking Kuwait would have to come up against, and they've been a major concern of all the planners here. All right, Brian, thanks very much. We'll be talking to you uh, later on during the, uh, the early morning hours here, the late morning hours there in Saudi Arabia. Now, uh, just a little while ago, I had the opportunity to talk just while we were on the break, uh, and Bill Cameron was handling things out of the journal studio. We had a talk, a conversation we want to show you with Elias Hazene, who is the vice president of the Arab-Palestine Association of Ontario. Here are those remarks. Mr. Hazene, the uh, bombing attack that's on in Iraq now, uh, details still very sketchy, but clearly a massive campaign uh, by the multinational forces against Iraq. Your thoughts, how do you react to that? Well, my main concern uh, right now and the concern of our community is the fate of uh, our relatives, uh, both in Iraq and in Kuwait. Uh, we are also concerned uh, right now that if the war escalate uh, and uh, chemical weapons are used, that our relatives and families in the West Bank and Gaza have not been issued with gas masks. This is uh, an extremely worrisome uh, to our community. Now, the uh, order did go out from the Israeli Supreme Court that they should be. Uh, do, are, as far as you're concerned, they haven't been yet? I have been in touch with the West Bank, uh, and up to uh, last uh, night, there was no uh, gas mask distributed to the vast majorities of the residents of the West Bank and Gaza. When you think of the long term, how do you feel uh, the impact will be on, on your uh, friends and family in the West Bank and Gaza as a result of what's happened tonight? Well, I think when the dust settled, uh, there are going to be a massive uh, amount of cleanup to do, and there are going to be a lot of thousands of civilian dead. And this is our, our main concern. Uh, how do we uh, get in touch with our relatives in, in both uh, Iraq and, and Kuwait, uh, and the rebuilding, obviously? Well, after that, I guess what I'm thinking of is the, 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 the interrelationship between those in the Middle East. What impact will this have on that? Well, we're hoping the United States uh, and, and their allies in, in the Gulf would take the same line, the same standard that they have set for Iraq and apply them to the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, the occupation of southern Lebanon, the occupation of uh, the Golan Heights by Israel, and also to the occupation of Lebanon, or at least part of Lebanon, by uh, Syria. Well, when you say take the same line, do you mean the same kind of thing is happening tonight? They should give that kind of ultimatum? Well, I think they should. They have set the standard. They have set the rules themselves. And I think they should apply them immediately after this uh, conflict is over. What about Saddam Hussein? Your thoughts uh, on him and uh, the point at which we've reached uh, as a result of the actions of his government going into Kuwait? Well, I think uh, the Saddam Hussein got in and uh, he created a conflict in there. But it would have been best served if it had uh, been left to the Arabs to solve it. The Arabs, and including Saddam Hussein, has agreed to a peace plan that the United States rejected up to yesterday. And which one was that? 
namely that there would be a linkage between uh, his withdrawal from uh, Kuwait and an Israeli withdrawal and a peace settlement in the whole region of the Middle East. But did you ever hear the words from Saddam Hussein, you're quite correct, the Americans did reject that, but did you ever hear the words from Saddam Hussein that he'd accepted or that he would ever withdraw from Kuwait? I think early on, in, uh, after he took over Kuwait, he has uh, said that we are willing to discuss all aspects of the conflict in the Middle East, including Kuwait. Mr. Hazani, we uh, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. Tomorrow morning's Globe and Mail, the headline, Allies Bomb Baghdad. We've been saying it all evening, seeing it in print still does something. It's a headline that I think many of us never thought we'd see in our lifetime. Our National Journal special coverage of the Gulf War continues now as we head back to the Journal Studios and Bill Cameron. Bill? Time has regrettably come, therefore, to act in the interests of preserving world order and in safeguarding the effectiveness of the United Nations. So far tonight, most of the reports we have heard out of the Gulf have come from Western reporters, Western sources, and because of that, it's difficult to figure out how full a story we've been hearing. Joining us now by phone from Cyprus, where he has been monitoring Iraqi radio, is Mike Theodoulou, a correspondent for National Public Radio. Mr. Theodoulou, what are you hearing? Well, what we're hearing, the latest on Baghdad radio, about four hours after the first airstrikes, was the voice of Saddam Hussein, defiant as ever, and responding with what he seems to be best at, more rhetoric. Uh, he said that the, uh, the treacherous uh, people have struck and they will pay for their crime. Victory is near and Kuwait will never be given up. Instead, he said the emirate will become the arena for an Iraqi victory and it will be followed by the liberation of Palestine, the Golan Heights and Lebanon. They'll all be returned to their rightful owners. So very defiant speech there. The broadcast wasn't very clear, but it still shows that at least Saddam Hussein has got his lines of communication and also that he is alive. There was some concern at the beginning that possibly it was a pre-recorded speech, but he did in fact mention the exact time of the, uh, the first airstrikes at 2.30 a.m. local time in Iraq. And that's probably not a coincidence. He's doing this precisely to demonstrate to the world that the uh, Allied forces did not get all of the telecommunications infrastructure in his country. That's correct. Uh, it doesn't seem a uh, coincidence a at all in that way, and uh, his defiance as well, even though it seems the, uh, uh, what American, uh, the American officials are saying that it does seem to have been a very, very successful airstrike. He, al he at least is uh, alive and apparently well, communications okay, and uh, according to reports from Baghdad as well, the capital itself remarkably undamaged. But that's not perhaps surprising, as the, uh, the American targets weren't civilian ones. They appear to have been very precise military targets uh, on the outskirts of Baghdad and elsewhere throughout the country. We've been trying to figure out what exactly has happened to the Iraqi missile capacity, the missiles in particular that were supposed to be headed for Israel at the outbreak of hostilities. What have you been hearing about that? Anything? Well, conflicting reports there. Uh, the Israelis uh, seem to believe that one of the first targets for the uh, Allied airplanes were Iraqi missile bases in the west of the country, these would have been the ones used for a strike against Israel. This could well be the truth. It could explain why Saddam hasn't lived up to his former threats to attack Israel as soon as he's attacked. It could as well be, though, that uh, Saddam Hussein knows what he's up against with Israel and wouldn't want to drag it into a war this way with a missile strike. He certainly does want to bring it into the war, it seems. But if he, if he did uh, uh, a missile strike, say, against Tel Aviv, which he said would be his first target, he could bring a massive uh, Israeli retaliation, possibly even a, a nuclear one. And uh, it doesn't look like he wants to involve Israel like this. All the right. Mike Theodoulou, we're, we're going to have to move on. Thank you very much for this. Good night. Good night. Now, all day Washington was in a somber mood, and then news of the attack on Baghdad, and tonight President Bush and his officials appeared confident that the Iraqi raid had been successful. Joining us from Washington is Tim Sebastian. He's special correspondent for the BBC. Tim, people in Washington I've been hearing are, are using the words textbook example of a military strike. They seem very pleased. 
Yes, I have to say they are pleased, but also Washington always uses the term textbook strike whenever they use their fighters, whenever they go into any kind of conflict. Uh, they've already said that the news we're getting is heavily laundered, heavily manipulated, and we won't, in fact, be getting that much of it in the days to come. So I think the initial reports are going to take a little time to bear out. The initial optimism is going to take a little time to bear out. Remember, it's taking even the experts a couple of hours to get reports from the satellite pictures. So the war is, what, five hours old at the moment. It's going to be some time before even they get reliable information. You have your suspicions, I suppose, based on some past history with news management in a number of countries. But have you yet run across any examples that you can point to of official news management, official distortion? No, I don't think so, and it, it, it's very early on. And I don't mean to suggest that they're not go to, going to distort the news for, for any but the best of motives, such as to protect their forces in the Gulf and in order to give um, very little comfort to Saddam Hussein. One of the big mysteries of the night for us so far has been what happened to the Iraqi counter-strike um, capability. What are you hearing about that? Well, Washington is saying that they believe they achieved a very high level of tactical surprise, whatever that means. I find that difficult to believe because the word going around Washington for the last couple of days was that they were going to strike sometime on Thursday. If we heard it, we must assume that Saddam Hussein heard it as well. But anyway, that's what they're saying. Um, they've had something like they and the other three countries involved in the airstrikes had something like 100 aircraft in the skies attacking um, Saddam Hussein's offensive capability both in southern Iraq and in Kuwait and apparently successfully hitting those targets so we must assume that the Tomahawk cruise missiles that went in first knocked out a considerable proportion of his radar and therefore left him unable to get into the skies and respond effectively. Uh, American diplomat uh, in Brussels is tell telling NATO people apparently that it is still possible for Saddam Hussein to give up pull out of Kuwait and not be bothered further effectively. Anybody in Washington take this possibility seriously? There is some talk tonight of what they're calling a strategic pause, um, that you may have eight, nine, ten days of concerted bombing runs, and we're looking literally at hundreds of possible strikes by Allied aircraft. Um, but at the same time, there is the attitude in Washington. They do want to go in and do the job. They have waited around for six months. They have as they put it, given Saddam Hussein every chance of coming to the negotiating table. And as President Bush said tonight, there was no response. Tim, thank you. We'll talk again. Good night. Good night. We know the mood in Washington tonight, but what is happening in Iraq and in the rest of the Arab world is very unclear right now. To help shed some light on this, we'll talk to Pamela Smith. She's an analyst with the Middle East Economic Digest. She's in London tonight. Ms. Smith, there was speculation that in case of a uh, huge disruption in the Middle East that dominoes would start to fall, that regimes would topple. Well now we've seen an, our, an uh, intervention. What do you expect? Well, although there's a lot of talk about there not being much retaliation from the Iraqi Air Force, I think the next 24 hours could well see uh, considerable disruption throughout the rest of the Gulf, certainly in Jordan and Syria possibly, and even possibly Egypt. But um, Saddam has always said that he would attack the uh, oil wells or blow up the oil wells in Kuwait and probably attack the uh, insta oil installations in Saudi Arabia. Now, even if he isn't able to do that, um, there has been a lot of fear that hasn't been really publicized that some of the minority groups, particularly the militant Muslim uh, groups loyal to Iran in Saudi Arabia's eastern province, in Bahrain and other parts of the Gulf could embark on sabotage from inside. And of course you don't have to go very far in the Middle East to find some angry, up, unhappy and hungry people. In Jordan, for example, the economy has literally been bent out of shape by the run-up mm -hmm. to war. I suppose the economic dislocation, the poverty and the, the new hardship is going to make the political situation that much less stable. I think there's no doubt about that and certainly there's a great uh, concern among Arab scholars that I know that the post-war situation, well, however it turns out, could be even worse. Certainly from the Jordanian point of view, the Palestinian point of view, but also from the point of view of an awful lot of Arab nationalists uh, throughout the area, this is an American war, and for them it is uh, double standards. 
once the uh, U.S. failed to agree on an international conference to go ahead and push that through, particularly along with the French, from their viewpoint, um, they are being asked to go along with the American attack on Iraq when the Americans really didn't do anything, for example, to oppose the Israeli attack on Lebanon in 1982. So I think both the combination of this latent era of nationalism, nationalism, this dislike of the extreme wealth and lack of democracy in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf states is going to produce some very disruptive effects over the next few days. Pamela Smith, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. 24 Canadian CF-18 fighter jets and their pilots and uh, um, assorted pers other personnel are stationed in Qatar. And with them is journal correspondent Kevin Tibbles. He joins us now from Qatar by phone. Kevin, what's the latest on the base? What's the action there? Well, there's plenty of action. Uh, if it was a quiet night, the, uh, the dawn was certainly shattered. Some 20 American F-16s took off this morning bristling with weapons. The Canadian 707 refueler took off just moments ago, and as I'm speaking to you from my room here, uh, two, four Canadian F, uh, CF-18s are uh, on the runway uh, getting ready to go. So uh, there is quite a lot of activity here in Qatar this morning. What are those Canadian planes going to be doing? Well, uh, as far as the uh, soldiers here are concerned, their mandate has just been changed by Prime Minister Mulroney. Uh, the, um, they are now planning to enter into what is called sweep and escort missions. Uh, prior to uh, the announcement last night, uh, or uh, tonight your time, by uh, Mulroney, the, uh, they have been in a defensive role. At this point, sweep and escort missions uh, means that the Canadians will probably be flying ahead of American bombers, for example, to clear the way for them to continue on their mission, or perhaps even uh, defend amphibious landings by the Americans should they uh, try to enter Kuwait that way. That would mean that the CF-18s would have to be re-equipped with air-to-ground weaponry, yes? Yes, they would. Uh, there's no problem with that. I've spoken with the commander here, Colonel uh, Romeo Lalonde. He says his pilots are trained for that. They have the weaponry. Uh, but I do understand that the, any sort of, rate, uh, sort of rate of this sort would have to take place during daylight hours. Some American reporters are saying that the Iraqi Air Force has been virtually wiped out which will come as interesting news to the Canadian pilots who have to go up into that airspace. What are they hearing about the state of the opposition tonight? I think they're hearing pretty much the same as, as uh, we are hearing on the outside. Um, I can tell you that there's a considerable amount of relief at the base, Canada Dry 1 and 2, and within the Canadian community here in uh, Qatar, because they all believe that the Americans have pretty much decimated uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, air force. I can tell you there were two alarms during the night, uh, perhaps uh, alarms uh, because of rumors that Scud missiles were headed towards Bahrain. The Canadians were uh, in their uh, protective chemical suits uh, and, uh, and uh, phone calls were made to the 101 Canadian citizens who are still here in Qatar. They, uh, the word went out through Canadian wardens to them. They were told to sit by their phones, have their gas masks ready, and get prepared to, uh, for a quick evacuation. So far, no evacuation of Canadians has taken place here. All right, the Kevin. The military is saying a morale Kevin, is very we're, high on the base this morning. Thank you, Kevin. We're out of time. Peter Mansbridge in the National. All right, Bill. Thanks very much. We do have some uh, the first pictures now of the evening. These uh, coming from the uh, cable news network that is the pool video uh, of the uh, U.S. Uh, reporting group in uh, the uh, area of the Persian Gulf. These pictures are of some of the crews leaving tonight, earlier tonight, uh, for their bombing runs uh, to uh, into Iraq. It's a little unclear exactly uh, what the pictures are and uh, from where they have been taken, uh, but we're told that the uh, pictures are of the Iraqi, or uh, of the American uh, pilots leaving for Iraq tonight. A quick update now on the unfolding war in the Gulf. Operation Desert Storm, a multinational effort to oust Iraq from Kuwait, is in its eighth hour. Massive airstrikes are said to have destroyed much of Saddam Hussein's potential to wage war. And the man who ordered the strike, George Bush, tonight told the world why he did it. We are determined to knock out Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein has used the last... Our next scheduled newscast will be at noon tomorrow. However, we will be on the air again if developments warrant it. The Iraqis kept up the firing all night. 
um, we were herded by hotel staff and security guards and what we call minders down into a basement shelter, deep in the basement of the Rashid Hotel. Uh, it seemed like a reasonable thing to do since none of us had phone lines. The phones went dead within, uh, within the first half an hour, uh, and that was the end of that. They're still dead at the hotel. It was impossible to say how much damage was inflicted. Certainly there was a tremendous amount of noise, a lot of concussions, uh, huge flashes. But this morning, Baghdad Radio has been playing the national anthem and, and reading verses from the Quran. Uh, and Iraqis um, are saying, hello, how are you? Is everything fine? They seem to, to be um, unfazed by this. Mind you, we haven't seen a lot of, of the civilian population. Early this morning, as I cruised through the misty streets, there were a lot of soldiers with kit bags um, making their way to who knows where, trying to hail any car that went by. There were no buses. And, and very few taxis. I did see a few broken windows, but that could have been from almost anything. In the central area, in the business district, in the residential areas that I drove through, I saw no signs whatsoever of damage. It's not clear at the moment what's going to happen to, for example, the scores of journalists trapped here. We had all been making plans last night to leave. Uh, we had had uh, tip-offs from our news organizations that we should uh, be making our way down the road. We were rather hoping to be on a charter plane to Imam Jordan this morning. Now we don't know what they're going to do. Then neither does anyone else in Baghdad, so I suppose the situation's equal. Alan, can you tell us any more uh, about uh, when the air attacks were at their height, what it was like, what you saw, what you heard? What I saw were a lot of flashes, most of them going up into the air tracer rounds from anti aircraft guns, which have been situated on all the strategic buildings, uh, uh, situated down in parks and wooded areas. We saw rockets going up for what I believe were SAM 7s. I've heard that sound before. It went over the hotel. Um, there was a lot of small arms fire, uh, but and a lot of heavy concussions, roaring noises in the air. But uh, you could see huge flashes from time to time, and one of my colleagues, Nick Gallo, said it just saw a huge ball of fire roll up into the sky. But you know, we can't, we could not tell what was hit because it was pitch black. The city was blacked out very, very quickly. The hotel was blacked out, and uh, when uh, when it got to be going fairly well, we went down into the basement shelters. I wasn't so worried about being hit from bombs as I was from the anti-aircraft gunners who were firing just absolutely wildly. I was in Tripoli, Libya, when the Americans came in, and it was much the same sensation. A tremendous amount of firing, noise, flashes, light, but uh, no obvious targets. You didn't know where anybody was. If, if there were uh, attack bombers coming in there, we didn't see them. We didn't really hear them. Uh, and I doubt that the gunners heard or saw them either. They were just blazing away. And since everything was cut off and we couldn't file, eventually we just went into the basement where um, several hundred people spent the night sitting on the floor deep in the basement of the Rashid Hotel. It was purpose built for the non-aligned summit, and it's very strong, and the shelter was very good. And after uh, an hour or so down there, we thought, well, let's venture up and have another look. And the guards locked us in. The hotel security people, they, Reminders that they locked us in and weren't allowed out until uh, about 6 o'clock in the morning, local time. Alan, uh, do, do the Iraqis claim to have downed any U.S. aircraft and, and or did you see any indication that any U.S. or Allied planes had been downed? Well, I haven't heard the Iraqis claiming anything so far, and I have seen no evidence of, of, of anything. I've, I've, I've driven around a section of the town. This is a huge city. I've driven around the small part of it. It took a circuitous drive of several miles to get here to the U.S. Embassy and saw uh, no damage at all. Uh, it's like nothing ever happened. It's very eerie. The first time I've been anywhere near a bombing raid when there was no sign of anything had happened. I think we're going to have to go out to the more outlying areas, the kind of strategic areas, if you will, to, to see things. But the Ministry of Information, the Defense Ministry, the Foreign Ministry are all close to us, and uh, we, saw, we saw no evidence that... Um, that anything at all happened. A colleague of mine, Michael Kelly of the Republic, has come in and jotting down a note for me. So we'll just hang on a sec. I'll see what he's done today. Uh, we're going to hang on while Alan Pizzi tries to bring in another uh, reporter who was an eyewitness. This is uh, live and direct uh, from Baghdad. Alan Pizzi reporting that while uh, he heard and indeed saw some of the uh, air attack during the night, as he made a short drive, it's a short distance from the Rashid Hotel to the U.S. Embassy, he did not in fact see much damage. 
Alan, are you and uh, your colleagues still there? Yes, Dan. Uh, my colleague has just told me that a French journalist says when he was driving around, he saw a large hole in the main telecommunications tower, which may account for the fact that uh, a lot of the telecommunications seem to be cut. The phones in the hotel are certainly cut. This call is being routed to Amman, Jordan. I tried repeatedly to dial both uh, London, England, and New York, and uh, got, a, got nothing at all. No one has gotten out of here. As far as I know, on these fronts, so perhaps that's the case. We had anticipated, of course, that the telecommunications tower would be a target, but um, people were also talking about the foreign ministry, the defense ministry, and the other government buildings. Uh, I could see those in the hotel and saw no evidence whatsoever that they had been hit. The, the large explosions seemed to be a fair distance away, and the concussions were, lo were big, but they, they weren't close to us. And uh, the hotel is within one kilometer, about two-thirds of a mile radius of most of what one would assume would be the serious, significant uh, military or political targets in central Baghdad. And I don't think they were going for this. I don't know what they were going for, but I don't think it was what we had feared. We haven't seen much damage in the part of downtown Baghdad you've been able to visit. Alan, from the Rashid Hotel, you, you can see uh, on a good day and even on a good night the presidential palace across the Tigris River. Any indication that the Iraqi presidential palace was hit. No, it was, it was pretty misty when I left the hotel, and visibility was, was, uh, was limited. But uh, I didn't see anything over there. You would have, we would have anticipated seeing smoke and that sort of thing. There was nothing like that at all. So I don't have any evidence that that palace was hit. There was a fair amount of activity over that way that I saw. We saw, of course, a, a tremendous amount of anti-aircraft fire coming from that direction. And uh, there were some flashes from the ground, big flashes that sounded like sounded and looked like something was hitting in the area. But, um, of course, it's, as you know, behind large walls and behind large gates. And, uh, I, the only evidence I would have would be smoke, and I didn't see any. Alan, you're one of the most experienced combat uh, correspondents in the world. As you're there in Baghdad and with limited access, you've had limited ability to look around, what is the single most important thing you think Americans should know about the war so far? It's hard to say, Dan. I think, uh, I think that the claims coming out of Saudi Arabia, that I've heard on the radio that, that, uh, that they did what they came to do, um, may well be true. Because, um, we were told that they did not intend to uh, hit the population areas. And so far, I haven't seen any. That's not to say that the suburbs are not But um, it, was a, it was an awesome display of, uh, of modern technology actually working. Uh, most of us sitting over here and uh, been thinking, well, so many things go wrong with this kind of technology. Uh, what are they going to screw up this time? And from what we've seen so far, and I stress, it, as you mentioned, it's a very limited point of view. It's anything wrong so far. I'm amazed that the Iraqis haven't done very much. We thought at one point last night we were hearing planes take off, but the, uh, the Allied forces, the U.S. forces, seem to have met very little resistance in Baghdad, other than a tremendous amount of anti aircraft fire, which every military expert I ever talked to said uh, was, was for show and for, to reassure the guys who had to man them and the people who had to look at them, and it wasn't going to bother any pilots. It certainly doesn't seem to have done that. Alan, busy, if you will, I'm going to break away for just a moment, but continue talking into that telephone. We'll be recording you here. That was Alan Pizzi live uh, from Baghdad. Uh, perhaps you could m make it out. There's a lot of crosstalk. That call was rooted through Amman, Jordan, to the United States. But Alan Pizzi, uh, who's seen a lot of hell, seen a lot of war, said that in the limited amount of time that he's had to actually look around during the daylight hours, it's daylight now in Baghdad, and for what he saw and heard last night, this is a quote from him, that the U.S. airmen apparently did what they came to do, a quote from Alan Pizzi. Uh, we'll get back to Alan Pizzi a little later on if that phone line stands up, and if it doesn't, we'll have uh, a recorded uh, uh, additional reports from him, but we're hoping that the live report from Baghdad will stay up. Right now, Bob Simon, our correspondent in Saudi Arabia, has had a look at the first pool pictures. These are the only pictures allowed, pool and censored pictures of American jets taking off for targets over Iraq. Bob? Then we'll have to wait until we get pictures from Iraq to see what those planes are really doing until we get an idea of what this war is really all about. Because what we've been seeing here and what you see on these pictures from this largest American base in Saudi Arabia, these pictures taken last night, these first pictures from the largest American base, are pictures of a neat, methodical, clean war, sleek, beautiful American aircraft taking off into the darkness. It is the only picture of the war we've been able to provide so far. These are 
F-15s from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in, in South Carolina. They carry cluster bombs. They carry heat-seeking missiles. They were on their way to Iraq. It will be some time, I'm afraid, before we have some idea of what these planes actually did once they got there, before we have some idea about the way the war is really going. What we're looking at here, Bob, uh, these are pool pictures, are they not, uh, of, of what was happening around the Dharan Air Base as the strikes were being made? Sorry, it looks uh, uh, roughly unedited uh, right now. Yeah, th th these are pool pictures of the, of the base near Riyadh, which is the, the largest American constellation here, which is a remarkable thing considering that just one month ago there was nothing here but, but a runway and a taxiway. The Americans came in and, and built a little empire here. They, they built everything there is. They built enough for thousands of personnel, for hundreds of aircraft. I was there last week, and the sight of all those squadrons of F-15s lined up one next to the other was just something staggering. I hadn't seen anything like it since I'd been to Cameron Bay in Vietnam, and, and frankly, Cameron Bay was dwarfed compared to what you see over there now. These are the pool pictures, American pilots strapping themselves into the cockpit of their aircraft, as uh, General Chris and others pointed out before. Many of these aircraft, uh, the pilot flies them alone. Uh, uniquely lonely feeling uh, to be flying single-handedly. One of these tremendously destructive uh, electronic and technological uh, advanced uh, pieces of weaponry. Some of the aircraft, uh, other aircraft, of course, uh, have more than one person in them. Some of the strike aircraft have, uh, are, are, have a pilot uh, and a navigator, bombardier, what uh, the amateurs might call assistant pilot in the aircraft with them depends on the kind of plane. David Martin of the Pentagon, as we look at these pool pictures, which uh, Bob Simon, I'm underscoring now, these were taken at the air base around Riyadh, not the one around Dharan, correct? That's correct, Dan. Uh, that uh, David Martin reported from the Pentagon earlier that uh, at least in the early going, that the naval-based aircraft uh, had not been at the point of, uh, of attack nearly as much. It was primarily uh, American ground-based ba uh, fighters and fighter bombers together with the Tomahawk cruise-style missiles, many of uh, which were fired uh, from uh, Navy craft such as the USS Wisconsin and the uh, USS uh, Missouri. They bore the brunt with the naval aircraft being primarily uh, held in reserve. Does that match what you've been told or been able to gather there, Bob? I think Bob... The Dan, is it, the word is that the, that the primary... Our, our sense here is that the primary air strike so far has been from these bases, yes. Uh, what you see are these ground crews. Let's look and listen for a moment as one of the planes took off north to Iraq. the fire, sitting atop that jet, uh, a young American, in this case, uh, as you can see, this is one of the ones, uh, as this plane taxis out, that has uh, two in the cockpit. Wave after wave of these aircraft, primarily land-based, took off uh, beginning at about uh, 4.50 Eastern Standard Time in the United States, uh, late uh, yesterday afternoon. That was in the uh, very, uh, well, oh, just about midnight uh, in Iraq and Kuwait. And then by about 7 o'clock Eastern time in the United States, as we look at these pool pictures from uh, the Riyadh base in Saudi Arabia, uh, there was at least the first climax of the air war uh, about 7 o'clock. If you listen carefully to Alan Pizzi's report a little earlier on, Bob Simon, Alan Pizzi said that just after 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time in the United States, that uh, would have been, uh, what, just after 2 o'clock in the morning in Baghdad is when he heard and saw the most bombardment in and around uh, downtown Baghdad. Dan, the amazing thing to me so far is how neat this has all been. Of course, again, we haven't seen the, the messiness on the other side of these, of these planes, the messiness they've created in Iraq. But the way in which this war has been scheduled, the way in which the deadline came and so shortly thereafter, the planes took off and the air war commenced, just as everyone had been predicting for so long. It is so rare in, in this business of ours that things happen the way we expect them to happen, and I think this seems to be one of, these, one of these rare exceptions. When we assess what seems to be the 
barely believable success of the operation so far, I think we must bear a couple of things in mind. One of them is that the American force that is arrayed here, the American force with the British and French allies, the American force that is arrayed here to fight Iraq is basically pretty much the, the, the size and extent of the American force that was meant to fight the Soviet Union. But instead of fighting the Soviet Union in Germany and Central Europe, it is fighting what is ultimately the third world power in the sands of, of Arabia, a far, a far lesser task than it was designed for. Bob, again, let's watch and listen for a moment as we watch the cool pictures of this mighty aircraft going north to Iraq. Bob, it's a sight you and I have seen many times around Dharan and Riyadh, and one which, speaking for myself, I know you agree, when you never cease, there's a certain fascination, uh, but an awareness of what the other end of that can be when they begin to unload uh, their weaponry. The it is a terrible beauty, Dan. It, it is a terrible beauty, and all the more terrible if you're on the receiving end. I'm reminded that uh, Major General Barry McCaffrey commands the army forces in Saudi Arabia. He's fond of quoting uh, General William T. Sherman, and General Sherman said, among other things, war is cruel, and you cannot refine it. And as we eventually, as we will, see the pictures of what those aircraft were doing uh, to targets uh, in Iraq and in Kuwait, one, I suspect, will be reminded that uh, while it's a terrible beauty to see those planes take off, when one is on the ground when they attack, Sherman's words, war is cruel and you cannot refine it, uh, will be echoing time after time after time. Now, as the war goes on, these are the headlines, and this is the storyline uh, of the hour. British fighters return safely to Saudi Arabia. The British say all of their tornado fighter bombers got back safely. At a NATO meeting in Brussels, the U.S. presses again for Saddam Hussein to pull out of Kuwait now. Baghdad Radio quotes Saddam Hussein saying that the mother of all battles has begun, unquote. Early U.S. Defense Department reports say that the war is successful thus far. British military authorities say that all of their tornado fighter bombers have returned, all the ones involved in the raid on Iraq, and have returned safely to their bases back inside Saudi Arabia. The United States told the emergency NATO meeting in Brussels that Iraq could be spared further destruction by an immediate pullout of Kuwait. There's no sign the Iraqis plan to do that. Baghdad is reported quiet. CBS News correspondent Alan Pizzi reporting live and direct from the Iraqi capital on this broadcast just a short while ago said that smoke still hangs in the air from the overnight attack. Pizzi drove uh, from the Rashid Hotel where he'd been in a bomb shelter for part of the night uh, to the nearby U.S. Embassy, said he didn't see much damage. One of his uh, fellow colleague reporters said he saw a giant hole in the ground. That would be right in the center of downtown Baghdad. But the communications center, the foreign ministry, and other main government buildings, said Pizzi, seemed to be uh, undamaged. Saddam Hussein was heard on Baghdad radio vowing that, in his words, victory is near. But the United States Defense Department tells a, a diametrically opposed other story. No U.S. losses reported so far. No reports of any Iraqi Scud missiles, that's their best uh, long-range missile, being fired. Indeed, the missiles uh, pointed directly at uh, Israel are reported to have been wiped out. Pentagon correspondent David Martin says the Scud missile sites uh, were reported hit very hard in the early stages of the attack. It's believed they were hit not only by manned aircraft of the sort you saw in the pool pictures from Riyadh, but also from American Tomahawk missiles. Those are cruise-style missiles fired from, among other places, U.S. naval warships. The Tomahawk is a long-range missile. It, uh, in this case, uh, it was launched uh, from surface vessels, not submarines. Uh, it carries each one of these Tomahawk missiles, a 1,000-pound warhead. It is among the most sophisticated and complicated pieces of weaponry uh, in the world today. War protests are being seen and heard around uh, this country tonight and some overseas. This particular one staged around a bonfire outside the United Nations here in New York. Uh, security has been tightened at U.S. airports as a precaution. Bomb squads are on alert at Los Angeles Airport as a precaution. And curbside boarding and baggage are now prohibited at the uh, Hartfield Atlanta Airport. All of those precautionary steps taken. 
and as Gary Reeves reported from North Carolina, and uh, one doesn't say this lightly in North Carolina, where at this time of year, basketball is a kind of a secular religion in North Carolina. The uh, North Carolina State game tonight was uh, called off as the war reports from the Persian Gulf uh, came in. CBS News White House correspondent Leslie Stahl reported uh, some time ago that at the White House, they were making uh, a, 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 an effort to uh, carefully uh, make it clear that while uh, President Bush was calling some members of the alliance, he had not called them in advance about the attack. Uh, the White House said the president didn't feel that was necessary. The White House was maintaining uh, a steady, uh, calm alert, at least uh, on the surface. CBS News coverage of war in the Gulf continues. And, uh, destruction that is being meted uh, to, to the Iraqis shock and sadness you say i expected anger as well of course anger but you know what can what can anger do at this uh, late uh, stage uh, in, in in the game uh, i myself and we in jordan tried very hard to get the americans to talk meaningfully to the iraqis or to have a dialogue with them but uh, the, the thing was never allowed by the united states which is most unfortunate because, uh, like I said, I think this, this, this is going to take a very, very long time. This is not the end of the matter, by the way. I mean, you know, this battle may get rid of Saddam Hussein one way or another, but I think uh, very soon other Saddams will be springing up throughout the Middle East, and the result would be just as ugly and just as bad. Other Saddams Especially, where? And, uh, maybe in Jordan, maybe in Iraq itself, maybe in Syria, in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, anywhere in the Arab world. You see, the, the, the shock has not sunk in yet into the Arab psyche that uh, we are really nothing but pawns in the hands of the West, and that really the, the Western powers are still uh, bent on colonial policy that they have not, not left. But because I understand that, but uh, the attacking forces ranged against Iraq include Arabs. Yes, of course. But the Arabs, whether they are attacking or uh, receiving the attack or watching on the sidelines, are pawns. And this is really one of the saddest and the most horrifying realizations that the Arabs will, will, uh, will realize very soon. And especially as the dust of this battle settles down. We are literally pawns in the hands of others, used and abused, or standing on the side helpless. I remember when we spoke a month ago, six weeks ago, you were optimistic. You thought that since President Bush had spoken about a regional security arrangement, that the future was hopeful, that this could be avoided. Well, I was hoping until actually the last few hours until uh, um, until 12 o'clock tonight, I was uh, last night. I was very uh, hopeful that uh, finally sense and decency and logic will prevail, and that the United States will carry on a dialogue with the Iraqis instead of because the Iraqis, as you know, have been saying in a million ways. And here I am not in defense of Iraqi occupation of Kuwait. I am against it. Jordan is against it. Uh, but uh, that a meaningful dialogue can be carried with the Iraqis. Saddam Hussein, whether you like him or not, has said over and over and over again, I am willing to talk even about withdrawal from Kuwait, provided I am given one a way out. But I can't do it under this fantastic pressure and uh, the threat that has been maintained against me. All right, Professor Kamal Abujabra, thank you very much. Good night. Yes, sir. Good night to you. Bye-bye. Canada's role in the Gulf changed dramatically tonight when Canadian pilots got the go-ahead to carry out offensive action over Iraq and Kuwait. We're joined now from Ottawa by John Sigler, a professor of political science at Carleton University. Professor Sigler, you've just heard Kamal Abu Jabber from Jordan speaking about sadness and anger, and certainly some of that is going to be directed at us. We're full participants now offensively. Well, I think we don't want to exaggerate that little language in the speech tonight. I mean, uh, what's really been said in its effect in the Middle East uh, was precisely uh, President uh, Bush's comment uh, as to what the nature of the force was, the four countries participating, and we were not part of that attack which took place uh, earlier uh, th tonight. Mm -hmm. All the same, um, 
the American Americans now are faced, the Allies are now faced with the, with the prospect of huge forces of anger, resentment, and grief boiling up in the Arab world, whether justified or not. How do you go about trying to neutralize that, trying to cope with it? Well, I think precisely we're going to have to look to see in the, in the, in the immediate sense as what's happened here is an idea that was widespread in my last visit uh, uh, this, this past summer, a sense that it was now a world system dominated by the United States. And the argument was made that at least will be feared. And so there will be some effect uh, on parts of the Arab world now of this, uh, I think, not very satisfactory relationship of having demonstrated such massive force. Uh, on the other hand, the idea that's been said over and over again that the United States has been generous and come along uh, on the Palestinian question and the peace conference, that's been greatly exaggerated. The U.S. tied up the Security Council for seven weeks and never permitted a statement about a peace conference to go into a U.N. resolution. Demonstrators around the world tonight are saying no blood for oil. Uh, I know many Arabs told me on my last trip through the area that if the national product of Kuwait was carrots, we wouldn't be seeing any guns ranged against the Iraqis for invading it. Well, I think that argument uh, has a great deal of validity to it. This was the immediate American reaction, was precisely the danger of Saddam Hussein, from their point of view, taking over exactly double the amount of the world's reserves. Uh, from 11% to 22%, and that's what caused the very strong, immediate American reaction. Now, that's not to say that as it developed, the question about the violation of the United Nations Charter wasn't there, but oil was the push, that's for sure. So, assuming that, that uh, conceding that, how do you go about persuading Arabs in the Middle East that, in fact, the only interest here is an American and allied move against a fundamental violation of human rights, and they should understand that and respect it? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult in the very sense that Saddam Hussein brought out, uh, even though he's not the Robin Hood for sure, and everyone agrees, in the following sense, that it's an essentially an alliance of the United States with the rich Arabs. Uh, with about 10% of the Arab population. The other 90% uh, aren't involved uh, in the richness here, although a country like Egypt has something to gain now by that Saudi Arabia will help uh, finance their own development. Uh, Syria got a $1 billion amount. And so you can see this kind of bit again where it's going to depend on American military protection and the largesse of these very rich oil producers. Uh, but that's not a combination for long-term security in the Middle East, there will be a great deal of resentment, as we heard from uh, Professor Abu Jaber. John Sigler, thank you very much. Good night. My pleasure, Bill. And now back to Peter Mansbridge and The National. Thank you, Bill, with our continuing CBC coverage of Operation Desert Storm, of war in the Persian Gulf. A lot of history has been made over the last eight hours. Much more will be written in the hours and days to come. Quickly then, the story so far. Just before 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, the multinational coalition launched one of the largest single airstrikes in modern times. Fighter jets bound from Saudi Arabia to Iraq. About 90 minutes later, they began hitting their targets again and again. The Pentagon is claiming it was a success, saying much of Saddam Hussein's war machine, including missiles aimed at Israel, has been destroyed. But the Iraqi leader sounds nothing like a man defeated. On Baghdad radio, he spoke these words. We will never surrender, he said. The mother of all battles has begun. A few reporters are witnessing that battle from inside Iraqi lines, among them the CNN reporter Bernard Shaw, he describes the scene in Baghdad now by the dawn's early light. It is all over for now. It is daybreak here and the city is trying to uh, come awake. People are coming out of uh, wherever they were hiding uh, in shelter. Some people are dazed, some people are walking slowly. But right now there is very little life in the streets. The traffic volume is very low. Remember, this is still a weekday, and that basically is it. We do not know where Saddam Hussein is. We do not know where the government officials are. We're hoping to learn something as soon as we can. 
Saudi Arabia is the staging point for much of this. It's been the linchpin for the U.S.-led coalition all along. The CBC's Claude Adams is there tonight. He reports now on how Operation Desert Storm started there. Operation Desert Storm began with waves of aircraft leaving central Saudi Arabia headed north. Among them were refueling tankers and sophisticated AWACS aircraft, loaded with radar and other electronic hardware to help direct an attack. Among the primary targets were Iraqi missile bases. None of these so-called Scud missiles ever reached their designated targets in Saudi Arabia. Still, in the capital, Riyadh, air raid sirens sent people racing to shelters. Some came fully dressed in chemical protective suits. In eastern Saudi Arabia, people also jammed underground hotel kitchens, which had been turned into airtight shelters. Overnight, there were two false alerts, an indication of how nervous Saudi authorities were about the chances of an attack. When the all-clear sounded, hotel staff and guests were allowed out. Peace and justice and they watched U.S. President Bush speaking on television. In Riyadh, Kuwaiti refugees welcomed the news that the war to liberate their homeland had begun. God bless them, and we thank them very much. We had confidence in the, all the uh, armies who were at the front, and thanks God they did it, and uh, I said he did a uh, big mistake, and uh, he's paying for it now. With the coming of dawn, there was a great sense of relief here. The retaliatory gas attacks that so many people had feared in the early hours of war never happened. Still, no one was putting away their gas masks yet. Claude Adams, CBC News, in eastern Saudi Arabia. In Washington tonight, there's a lot of confident talk about the war. George Bush saying the airstrikes were carried out according to plan and promising to wipe out Iraq's war-making potential. The CBC's Terry Malefsky has more on The View from Washington, beginning with the official announcement tonight that war had begun. The world prayed for peace. People are just naturally... Operation. I'll explain when I see you. And you'll... Um, he's... With uh, more power. Congressman Dorn of California says he believes, quote, it could all be over by tomorrow, sunset, two days maximum. Also, reaction coming in from Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein has called President Bush, and I quote, a hypocritical criminal, and he vows to crush the American attack. That came in a Baghdad radio broadcast. Unquestionably now, with Saddam Hussein's uh, voice, whether it was a pre-taped, pre-recorded message or not, is not yet clear. Alan Fizzy reports from Baghdad that the television transmitting facilities in Baghdad may indeed have been hit in the airstrikes. Bob Simon is in Dharan with the latest. Bob? Dan? More air activity in Dharan, more our air activity at this massive uh, base here. F-15s have just been taking off again. I'm afraid this might be getting monotonous, Dan, but this is what we see of the war from here. And the remarkable thing is that it is, in fact, what we have been seeing for the last six months. There are more F-15s today. They're coming more frequently. They're taking off more frequently. But we've been watching this for six months, and it's rather, rather strange, in fact, almost unreal, to realize that this time they're not going up there to fly neat patterns around around the Kuwaiti Saudi border but they're they're going into action that those these are the guys who are going to to bomb the targets in Iraq I think it's a rather good sign from what the American command has been telling us they intended all along that you don't see much bomb damage in downtown Baghdad it has been crucially important for the American plan not to get Iraqi civilians killed not to have pictures broadcast throughout the Arab world of Iraqi women and children and if downtown Baghdad is relatively unscathed I think it is another sign that things are going according to plan Dan. That's true uh, Bob that uh, uh, General Colin Powell has said uh, that uh, particularly in recent days that civilian targets uh, would not be uh, on the on the early hit list those are my words not his but that was a clear uh, inference and indication that civilian targets would be avoided if possible and from every indication tonight's airstrikes are centered on the military targets Bob uh, there's no sign of ground combat anywhere the emphasis has been on the air war I'm thinking about some of those uh, commanders and their troops that we met on this most recent trip Colonel Glenn Pope who's with the cavalry army cavalry unit north of where you are there Marine Colonel uh, Jim Mattis 
thus far no ground combat. No ground combat then, and I'm very curious as to how much they know about the air war. You'll certainly remember that when we went to see them, they relied on us entirely for, for their news of what was going on in the, in the world, political developments, diplomatic developments, because they were so entirely out of touch. And now there aren't any journalists visiting them. This, the access of journalists has been severely restricted over the last couple of weeks. And I really wonder how much they know, if they know anything at all, about the air war that's being waged while they've been sleeping in the desert. And staying on the alert in the desert for any possible Iraqi attack. But uh, one part of the storyline, up to and including now in the early stages of this war, emphasis on air attack, no ground combat. Connie Chung has been following domestic reaction to this outbreak of war. And Connie, the, the word war even sort of catches in your throat a bit. It, it was, until a few hours ago, still almost inconceivable it would happen. It has happened. It's chilling, and, um, and I think what we're seeing here domestically is the crystallization of a new generation of student activists, just as they were in the 60s. We're fond of calling the 70s and the 80s uh, the me generation in which students were not political activists, but tonight, spontaneous demonstrations across the country, particularly here in New York at the United Nations. We have some tape of a demonstration that has been going on all night. These were mostly young college-aged people. They built a bonfire with police barricades. There have been two arrests only now out of about 2,000 people who have been there. They began moving back towards Times Square where they had begun. These demonstrations have occurred all across the country in several cities. Students even in uh, uh, Virginia, in uh, Alabama, many cities that you would not necessarily think that students would suddenly spontaneously begin demonstrations. Uh, we don't want to dwell on the demonstrations, though, and for that purpose, we went across the country with our correspondents and producers to ask Americans how they feel about the American involvement as of tonight. Bob McNamara is in... Uh, ...being told that they were Saddam Hussein's target. There is a confidence, I think, that uh, the Americans can neutralize Iraq. We spoke earlier tonight to the health minister who said that Israel was given some notice a few minutes before the Americans launched their attack. We don't know yet exactly what happened there and how uh, successful the American operation. I believe it's uh, devastating. I believe it's efficient. And uh, I uh, want to hope that within 24 hours, maybe it will be all over with. The government immediately slapped a curfew over the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. One point Israeli radio keeps making to the country is that Israel is not involved at this time and has not taken any action whatsoever.